call the April 26 Planning and Sustainability Commission to order. Um, the items on the agenda today include items of interest from the commissioner, followed by the director's report, consent agenda. We will be having a hearing on the Multnomah County Courthouse and making a recommendation on it tonight. If you're here to testify for the courthouse, please um, fill out a card in the back of the room and bring it to Julie. That hearing will be followed by a briefing on deconstruction code language, then a briefing on solid waste rates, and a work session on um, residential and open space zoning map. So any items of interest? Mm -hmm. This is a little um, touch base about the residential infill project that Teresa and I are both on. Um, and to let folks know that the proposal with the modified schedule, originally this group was presented with the task of getting something in front of the Planning Sustainability Commission by um, January of 2017. Um, and due to some machinations in City Hall, the proposal is now to skip past us um, with a term sheet going to City Council so that it can be voted on before the end of the calendar year, at which point it comes back through the Planning Sustainability Commission and back to City Council. So it's not a very efficient process. It's something that is not, I think, the ideal way to run this show. Um, it means the City Council is gonna have to hear it twice with public testimony both times. Um, but the hope is that by getting a term sheet done, um, which I would argue probably is policy, but some might argue it's not policy, um, it would get um, a first vetting by City Hall before they go and write all the code work. So I'm a little bit concerned by the process. I think those who want to cry foul will cry foul if they don't get happy with the results. But I'm also optimistic. I think there's a good opportunity for compromise between folks who want to decrease the size of homes that can get built. Um, that's very important to a lot of people and also provide more flexibility within them. And I think that the chance of going through this process, if that helps, um, implement that kind of compromise, then um, they'll be supportive along the way. Okay, any other items? No? Susan? Wow, okay, consent agenda. Consideration of the minutes from April 12th. Move adoption. Second. We're going too fast. I we second. Can't keep up. <laughs> Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Okay. So one more time. This is a hearing for the Multnomah County Courthouse. Um, if anybody has um, would like to testify, there are cards in the back of the room. If you could fill them out and then please bring them up to Julie. We'll be limiting testimony to two minutes. Um, and I also want to give everybody here a moment. Are there any conflicts of interest that anybody would like to declare? Go for it. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Troy Doss, senior planner, VPS on the Central City team. Um, I'm going to have a quick presentation on this. It's a fairly simple proposal, all things considered. We're really just talking about a height amendment. Um, and then afterwards, I'm going to have uh, representatives of the county, uh, the project manager, uh, DJ, DJ Deschamps, will be here, as well as Commissioner Sheprak will be here to answer any questions you may have about specifics about the project. Um, so let me start. Uh, we're talking about lot eight. Um, as you probably are aware of the, the proposed site for the courthouse, it's the right at the Hawthorne Bridgehead. So it's this lot here. The site incorporates the Jefferson substation, which is a historic landmark, and it will be st staying on site and actually will be incorporated into the programming of the courthouse itself. And they can give you a little more specifics about how that's going to be done. But it promises to be a pretty interesting amenity built into the courthouse itself. Um, so this site currently has a zoning of uh, height allowance of 200 feet. That has the potential of getting up to 245 feet through uh, commercial office type bonuses. Um, but in the West Quadrant plan, we took a look at this site and we found that this site, and you heard a lot of testimony uh, in favor and in opposition to heights throughout the Central City, but in, with regard to this site, we talked about bridgehead height during the West Quadrant plan. And the consensus was, was that 325 feet would be appropriate at this bridgehead as well as some of the other bridgeheads throughout the West Quad. Um, looking at this, we did some preliminary review analysis, and we said, yes, there are some views coming through here, but this site actually is not <coughs> impacted by one currently. Um, the proposal would be to go up to 325 feet on this site. That was the proposal from the West Quadrant Plan. We're talking about trying to do it now. Um, we'll get to a little more specifics as to why that's the case in a minute. 
Um, so we're looking at if the areas that we already in our discussion draft for Central City 2035 that had proposed for 325. This is the one block of that area of three blocks that's currently proposed for that. Um, the basis for this is they're looking at about 460,000 square feet of programming for the courthouse space. This is to accommodate current need as well as growth um, in, in court facilities that, that are needed. Um, we're only talking about 17 floors, and so the difference here would be, yes, you could probably get a 17-story structure in a 325-foot or even 200-foot in most places. However, corporate rooms are a little bit different because the floor-to-ceiling programming requires at least 18 feet. Um, so you're really talking about much higher floor plates than you would typically see in your typical office building or institutional building. So for that reason, it pushes this up to um, 17 floors, comes out to about 324 feet in this case. So they are looking at trying to use the full volume of the height uh, proposed to the West Quadrant Plan to make this project work. Um, some, yes? Why is it 18 feet? Um, you have a lot of different programming that goes into a courthouse. So you have the, you know, the judges stand, you have the jury boxes, everything is actually much higher. You also have equipment that goes into it as well. So there's just a lot more that goes on that you can't typically fit into a typical 10-foot you know, floor-to-ceiling kind of floor plate. Um, we did some shadow analysis just to kind of take a look at what would happen here. Uh, April 21st is typically when we look at that. So April 21st, 3 p.m., uh, we're looking at there would be some shadows. Of course, you look at this, most of the tall buildings along the waterfront do provide some shadows. The courthouse itself would primarily be providing shadows down onto the Hawthorne Bridgehead itself as opposed to the Greenway. Um, this is some analysis that was done by um, the architect for the project, SRG, showing something similar one month in advance, so on March 21st from the solstice. Um, so uh, quite simply, the recommendation is to go from 200 feet today to 325 feet. Uh, one thing I would note is that the maximum height would be 325 through Central City 2035 plan. So we wouldn't be looking at, and then bonuses above, the maximum height would be capped at 325 feet, period. Um, and with that, I think I'll turn this over to our county representatives to ask any additional, if they have any additional questions about the courthouse itself. Do you have any questions about the proposal, first off, with me? Oh, there, go ahead, Chris. So just to understand the relationship between what we're doing tonight and the West Quadrant Plan, if, if the county were willing to wait for the West Quadrant Plan to become adopted, no further action would be necessary, right? That's a basically acceleration, or is there actually additional height? And I think the, the better question is, is if the county could wait. The problem with this is that there's approximately $32 million that's been uh, allocated by the state legislature to this project with the contingency that the project break ground by the first quarter of 2017. Mm -hmm. So it probably doesn't allow us to wait for full implementation, right. which of 2035 plan, which is looking at about 2018 at this point. We would lose height, the funding for the project. Right. But this height is no higher than what we've already adopted. It is exactly what has been discussed during the West Quadrant yeah. Plan. Thank you. Eli? Um, do you have a projection for what the cost might be for the additional FAR you're trying to round up? I do not have that. Um, they're not really looking at additional FAR, though, because they do have FAR that's already available to them through a number of different ways of getting there. Um, they can use green roof bonuses. They can use bike locker bonuses. They can use historic transfer bonuses, which they do have. Um, historic resources, including the existing courthouse that they could be transferring FAR from. How they get there, I'm not sure. That's not really part of this proposal itself. Okay. When I, when I read the memo, it looked to me like there was some yet to be identified beyond what you could get through the straightforward bonuses. And I just, the reason I asked the question was um, if you guys are running short on FAR and might have to write checks for it, I'd rather the proposal come to the commission and to city council to get an FAR adjustment also. Um, I don't a, believe they need one, but I'll let, I'll let uh, DJ respond okay. to that. Thanks. Or JD's for some. Okay. Maggie? Your, your mic. <laughs> Thank you. This doesn't pertain to height, but I'm curious as we're talking about financing, was there any minority women-owned contracting in this process that you know of? Yeah, and I'll have to turn that over to the county to respond Great. to that. Thank yes. you. Other questions? No? I think that's it, Troy. But oh, Commissioner. Oh, yeah. Gary's. <clears throat> this is a follow-up on my colleague's question about the ceiling heights. Um, the 18 feet in reading through the staff report um, seems to have as much to do with the grandeur of the courtroom as it does with the practical um, physical layout. And I was curious as to how standard the 18-foot ceiling height is uh, in courtrooms across the region or across the country. 
may let their uh, architectural team respond to that one. I'm will. sorry. I'm, I'm going to let their you. architectural team respond to that if it's okay with you. They are better suited to answer that question than I am. The county's architectural team is also here. I, I'm sorry. The, I'm the architect for the project is also here. They can probably respond to that question better than I can. Mm -hmm. I really do. I couldn't answer that with any detail. Okay. Any other questions? No? Oh, okay. Good afternoon. I'm Judy Shiprock, County Commissioner for District Number Three, uh, which is Southeast Portland. The district is entirely within the city of Portland, uh, from Cesar Chavez out to 148th, and from the Banfield to the Clackamas County line, just to give you kind of a feeling for that district. I've been advocating for a new central courthouse since my first days as a county commissioner in 2009. And my support for this project is also informed by my experience as a deputy district attorney for Multnomah County in the 1980s. Um, there were problems with the existing courthouse back then that had been identified in the 1960s. And I can say it hasn't gotten any better. Um, the building is functionally and structurally obsolete. Um, and we've been studying how to replace uh, or renovate the courthouse for uh, over 40 years now. And I'm very proud of our progress. We really have a tremendous amount of momentum, both with um, the city of Portland, uh, with the county, and with the state. Um, so we have completed a very robust process of site selection and facility programming. And I'm pleased to say that our design team um, is just outstanding and that we have commitments of millions of dollars in funding. The county is, is really working shoulder to shoulder with the city of Portland on this project. I'm, I'm very pleased about that. I know that this building is going to be um, something that reflects the pride that the city feels in its own appearance um, and in the compatibility with the river um, scape, really the, the cityscape. We've been very careful uh, in those design features. Um, our collaboration with the state is a financial collaboration with a significant portion of a $300 million price tag coming from state funding on the condition that we stay on this schedule and that construction start in early 2017. Um, it does require uh, the city to approve the increased height on this block to 325 feet. Um, and I'm here today to ask you to uh, recommend approval of the zoning amendment. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is J.D. Deschamps with Multnomah County Facilities and Property Management. I am the project manager for the county on this project. And I think Troy has pretty much given you a great update and anyone who's been on jury duty in the existing courthouse can understand uh, kind of the needs and why we would need a new courthouse. Uh, if it's all right, I'll just maybe answer some of the questions that have That'd already be perfect. been Thank uh, you. brought up. Uh, with regards to the MWSB participation, uh, the county set a goal for both the architect and contractor. We also did something that we have never done before and is very rare in the market. We selected the architect without any, any subs. We then jointly with our contractor selected them and informed them 15% is the goal. That's the low end. They've reached 18%. Uh, Hoffman is our contractor. They had a goal of 18. They've committed to 20. So we are very committed to MWSB participation and very happy that we've had good success so far and we'll be, we've had, um, pretty much we have an outreach event a month and we'll continue to have them until we fill up uh, the team for that, that item. Uh, with regards to your question about the floor to floor height of 18 feet, so uh, SRG is our local architect, but they teamed with CGL Ritchie Green who are, they only really do justice and uh, justice facilities and other facilities of that type. 
And as we brought them in, the first thing they said is 18 feet is low, but what they've typically used for courtrooms. And part of the reason is to have, you have the dais for the judge and you have the dais for the um, witness box and also for the jury a little bit higher. But because of the nature of a courtroom, you don't quite have the same ceilings because you can't have the mechanical equipment making a lot of noise. So you have a different mechanical system and a different layout. And so that's why we have the 18 foot floor to floor because you can't have one courtroom with the sound leaking over to another. So it's a, a different uh, approach. And then I think the other question related to the FAR, uh, we do not plan to be buying any. We have a number of mechanisms, which, we're, which Troy has already brought up. So I think we, we've got a plan going forward for that. And uh, I think that was the questions, unless there are others. OK. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? No? OK, thank you very much. Thank you. So if there's anybody who would like to testify, if you could please fill out a card and bring it up to Julie here. Thank you, Julie. Sam Galbraith. If there's anybody else, going once, going twice. Uh, please fill out a card if you do. Sam, please come on up. Yeah, I was kind of just filling in time there. Um, two minutes, please. Thank you. My name is Sam Galbraith. For 40 years, I've been a member of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. I also served on the group who drafted the city's preservation ordinance back in the 70s and declared the first city historic districts, the Yam Hill and the Skidmore Historic Districts. And in my life, uh, working in community development, um, a substantial part of that has been devoted to uh, historic preservation and adaptive reuse of older buildings. I'm not here to raise any objection at all to the zone change um, before you or those recommendations, but I would suggest your consideration of a condition uh, that you might place um, on city council um, with respect to the Jefferson Street substation. Um, first of all, I'd just like to commend the staff of the county for the work they've done to gain control of the entire block over the last year after the initial site selection was made. Um, they now control the whole block, but the plans still call for the preservation of the Jefferson substation. A mediocre building at best, which is not unique in its uh, embracing uh, a functional style for uh, electric substations that were, uh, many were developed in the city at that time, many still exist. But its removal, and city council can do this, it can remove it from the uh, list of uh, historic buildings designated by the council and open the way to its demolition so that indeed the architects can use the entire block at the new FAR, at the new height limits, which will create the opportunity for a much more efficient building, large enough to really comfortably hold the program um, that needs to be included. So I would encourage this uh, very much um, and not be swayed by those that say, oh, it's a National Historic Preservation, I mean, it's a National Historic Landmark. Uh, that is an easy uh, thing to, to remove and in no way uh, should inhibit um, its use for the entire block. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Are there any questions? Teresa. So could you tell us exactly what is in that building? Uh, <laughs> well, it used to be filled with um, uh, all of the materials that were necessary for uh, a, a, a generating station. So it was, and, and I think it was steam powered, and so it was powered off of steam that was driven by a steam plant that was down on the, on the Willamette River in what is now um, River Place. And all that's left, it's been converted to offices. But the, there's one large space that's been maintained that has the old overhead crane that moves back and forth on rails that was used to pick up pieces 
of the generators so that they could be maintained. Um, it, as, a, as, a, as an artifact, is interesting, but it's internal to the building and is certainly not expressed on the outside, and you'd find similar things in many um, um, you know, buildings uh, of its type uh, still left in the city. Chris? But if you ask most people what was in that building, they'd say the variable quandary, right? No, because the variable quandary is actually a separate parcel. Um, the only thing of the variable quandary that's in that building are the places where the uh, video games are and the bathrooms. Other than that, the, video, the, the variable quandary is a separate parcel which actually borrowed some land from the county to, to expand its kitchen. So it's a that, that is not a protected building in any way, except reminiscing, you know, we, we love it. But that's a fait accompli. And Denny West has accepted his uh, retirement and has accepted the deal uh, that the county presented to it. So it, they're two separate parcels, two separate buildings. Well, I had that association. As I looked up online what this building looks like, and it was, the Verito Quadrille was very, distinctive one, the one next to it is not nearly as distinctive in my mind. So I'm, I'm curious whether the county did, well, I've had properties before where you have an in-holding and it's extremely expensive. Um, did the county look at the cost comparison of doing this program with that building taken down, which also would be a city council decision? Um, just my own personal observation, the county seems cowed by the historicans, the hystericans, I call I'm, I'm one of them. And they don't want to confront um, people like me who are passionate about historic preservation. Um, and generally, I would applaud that. But, um, and, and in fact, the existing courthouse, of course, is listed in the same way that the building I'm advocating for removing is. And I think they should still stand by the guns and make sure when that's disposed of, it is disposed of conditional upon its adaptive reuse within the current confines of that building. But I don't know that they've ever asked the architects to look at how much simpler the design would be and how much more efficient it would be because that's never been on the table to my knowledge. Okay, any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Oh, you had a, you had a question, Gary? The, um, the preserved building, that's about a quarter of the total footprint? Exactly. Okay. And it's only three, three stories tall, so it's a three FAR in a, a district that I think, well, the, the FAR is going to go to, I don't see it up there, but it, will, it would result in a substantial underutilization of the envelope for that full block. Thank you. Okay, one last time. Is there anybody else who would like to testify? Okay, it doesn't look like it, so with that, we'll close the hearing. Thanks, Troy. I, uh, I failed to mention one thing, too. Uh, there, there have, we have received, and you should have copies, of six letters regarding this. Um, there was testimony uh, from a private citizen um, in opposition to the project, but there are then five letters in support. Um, from the you know, Multnomah County Bar Association, Executive Director of Oregon Public Defense, uh, the Chief Justice of the Oregon Supreme Court, uh, District Attorney, and the presiding judge of the Circuit Court for Multnomah County. So, could could you explain briefly the opposition, the point of opposition? Was it the height or the? It was mostly height, and it was a kind of a reference more to what happened during the West Quadrant Plan and the fact that although that may have been approved by the PSC and City Council, the final actual zoning height has not been adopted yet. And so the question is far from settled as far as that individual is concerned. Any other additional questions? Um, two questions, one is, um, if you were going through the city process um, and waiting for the zone change to happen, as it's slated to, um, there may be linkage fees or other sources of funds that the project would have to pay towards affordable housing. Um, I'm wondering, you may, you're not the right person to answer this question, I know, it'd probably be the sponsors, but whether that might be a, um, something that 
the county would, would pay um, if the city adopts um, linkage fees or something like that between now and when the code goes in place? So that'd be one question for the county. Um, and and I'll, I'll throw out one more question um, while you're coming up. Is, I mean, I, I just looked at this, this building. I, th I would be, I'm not gonna try and micromanage county finance here. Obviously, this is a planning commission meeting, but it seems like there would be a high potential for the county to save millions and millions of dollars um, if they um, took down the existing building and did a more efficient construction type. And if that were on the table, and thinking what the county might do with those funds, there might be some pretty exciting things the county could do. So I would, um, uh, speaking for myself, I guess, encourage the county to look that up, run, run some back of the envelope calculations, um, because that there could be some really compelling uses of those funds in scarce budgets. Thanks. Um, so regards to your first question, which I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, it was. Oh, if if. If the city council approves this zoning change now, rather than at a time, 2018, I don't know when our comp plan is going to be updated, <laughs> 2020, let's just say, yeah. um, the the city might get sorry, I might get some linkage fees passed or other funding for permanent affordability housing in Portland, and um, by approving this change now, it would potentially mean the county wouldn't pay that fee. Uh, related to that, um, the county's budget just last week included 10 million dollars for homelessness. So the county has already demonstrated their willingness to participate in it. The rest of your question is beyond staff level. It would become a board decision. Uh, it is something that can be brought up to the board and discussed. Um, in regards to your question, the first thing I did when I brought the architects on board was say, can we demolish this building? What would be the step forward? What would be the risks? And they looked at and they said, your biggest risk is having a lot of people show up and protest that you're going to demolish the building, and then city council delays, then we don't have a project to bring forward for design review, therefore we don't get any money from the state and the project dies. So we studied that. We actually, one of the concepts when we had, when we were looking at any site downtown, what the architects actually developed is they wanted to have an L-shaped -shaped site. And the reason being downtown are 200 by 200. And if you put eight courtrooms on a site like that, what you run into is actually very little light. You run into a, a building that doesn't really, um, it isn't really great for the users. So the way the building is laid out, we have a long NATO, NATO Parkway, so the view of the, of the Willamette are all the courtrooms. And we did that intentionally because we wanted to have, if you're coming or going from a courtroom, very stressful situation. You come out of the courtroom, you have a view of Mount Hood. It takes a bad day, and maybe at least it helps a little bit. So we did look at doing the building in different orientations, and this goes back two years ago. So we did kind of study that. And, take, and one of the advantages actually we like about using uh, Jefferson Station is the overhead crane. Everybody who walks in, who looks at the overhead crane goes, now that's cool. And I pointed out at my board presentation two weeks ago, we're the only county office building that has a crane. <laughs> what are you going to use that crane for? Uh, to lift away the bad people. <laughs> <laughs> it's what the sheriff always says. <laughs> Maggie? I have one last question while you're up here. Um, so in terms of energy efficiency, um, can you reiterate, because I know that was, a, that was one of the goals we put forward yeah. for new buildings, um, or the city did, uh, what would this building entail? Uh, we're going for, aspiring for LEED Gold version okay. 4. We are working towards the 2035 um, Architecture 2030 plan. Um, I have <laughs> County Office Sustainability. I have a sustainability consultant. I have somebody in facilities and, on sustainability. And everybody on my team talks sustainability. Uh, so from that point of view, I got a lot of backup to make sure I do the right thing and get it right. So we have a lot of people making sure that it's a energy efficient building built to the 21st century standards for any building and it's going to be gorgeous. The, the chair turned to me right at the beginning and said, don't give me an ugly building. So we're working hard at that and all the other goals. Any other questions? I would just encourage you to be lead platinum. 
You can do better. Lead you can gold, try. Lead How gold or better. There you go. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Discussion? Motion? Go for it, Chris. So from a policy point of view, this doesn't seem like much of a stretch. We've already approved 325 feet with the West Quadrant plan. Um, you know, notwithstanding the opportunity to maybe collect some linkage fees, if we waited, that doesn't seem like a good trade-off uh, for, uh, for public purposes here. So I would move that we recommend uh, that the uh, height limit on Block 8 be raised to 325 feet. Second? Any discussion? Okay, Julie? Austin? Yes. Ted? Yes. Feedback? Yes. Hey, Martin? Yes. Comment? Yes. Oh. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Best <laughs> hearing and recommendation <laughs> we've ever had. We're going to have a little bit of a break now, I think. Is everyone here? Actually. Okay. Well, we don't need, if we can get everyone here, we can keep rolling. That might really over make there. Andre upset. I know.
doesn't sound like it. Hello. All right. There was a green light. Um, good evening. I'm Sean Wood with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I'm here to give a update on uh, deconstruction code language. So as you might recall, I was uh, here back on January 26th to give a briefing on a resolution that BPS was taking to city council. That resolution directed BPS to uh, develop code language that would require projects seeking a demolition permit um, for houses or duplexes to deconstruct that structure, so disassemble it and save the materials for reuse. Um, if the house or duplex was built in 1916 or earlier or was designated a historic resource. Um, the resolution was unanimously approved by City Council, so that was great news. Um, and then I also wanted to uh, thank the PSC for submitting a letter of support for that resolution. Well, thank you. Um, since uh, February 17th, staff's been busy developing uh, draft code language, and we've been working with um, our own staff, the Bureau of Development Services, um, and the city attorney, as well as our deconstruction advisory group um, for advice on developing that code language. And we released a public review draft of that last week, and that kicks off a four-week public comment period. Um, so during that time, I'm out um, visiting uh, landmarks, design commission, the PSC, neighborhood coalitions, and um, essentially a roadshow looking for feedback on that on that draft. Um, you should have a copy of the code language in front of you as well as just a kind of a, a two-page uh, summary document. Um, in terms of the, the code language, one of the things I've found in, in uh, working on developing it is that a, a lot of codes are, are pretty simple in the sense of what you want um, to get out of it. Um, it's how you ensure compliance and quality that's the, the tricky part. Um, so we're taking a number of approaches to guarantee that we get what we're asking for without too much um, kind of enforcement need. One is the use of certified deconstruction contractors. So that's not something that exists currently in the marketplace, but we're developing um, a training and certification program uh, using the Building Material Reuse Association. Um, they have a, a manual as well as um, trainers across the nation that can assist us in that. Um, the other thing we'll require is a pre-deconstruction and a post-deconstruction form where they can identify the materials that they're um, planning on salvage and we can kind of compare before and after. They can identify if they're using um, mechanical equipment and then also identify um, who the certified deconstruction contractor is. Uh, we'll also require uh, receipts and documentation of materials that were either donated or sold or reused on site um, or recycled or disposed of. And then BPS would be responsible for random inspections. Um, so there's no really good time in a deconstruction process to go out and inspect a site. Um, so we would rely on uh, random inspections and then also uh, posting the site with uh, signage saying that the property is being deconstructed and who to call for concern. So if you think about something like erosion control concerns, you may have seen those signs in front of a development project. We'll take a similar approach so that if someone sees uh, something going on that doesn't look like deconstruction, it looks more like mechanical demolition, they can give us a call and we can go out to the site. Um, there'll also be a, a fair amount of, I think, uh, outreach needed on, on both the building uh, and development community side as well as the neighborhood side so everyone knows exactly what is expected on these sites so we don't necessarily get calls someone saying oh there there's a heavy piece of machinery out there we allow that to a certain degree um, within the pro proposed code language so it'll be uh, some importance placed on that for sure um, training and certification I alluded to that in terms of the certified deconstruction contractor we've um, we're working with a, a local consultant on helping develop that plan for the training um, we're taking a, a high road approach where we're going to have priorities for both training and hiring um, in terms of women people of color and uh, traditionally or historically disadvantaged communities uh, we're going to kick off uh, that process on may 18th which actually coincides with the end of the public comment period um, we have a number of folks that will help us craft that and at the, the end of that process we'll have a solid plan for how we're going to roll that out and how the different uh, organizations can help participate and also funding sources um, we also need a training program for labor so the 
These requirements will effectively triple the amount of deconstruction work in the city of Portland over the course of a year. Um, we're going to need additional people doing that work. So um, workforce development is going to be a kind of a critical path for this for sure. Um, and then uh, one of the other things to help support the requirements on um, deconstruction typically can cost more than uh, uh, traditional mechanical demolition. And we have a deconstruction grant program, which I think I spoke about a little bit at the last time I was here. Um, that's ongoing. We initially seeded it with $50,000 from the Solid Waste uh, Management Fund reserves. Uh, we also recently received an additional $50,000 from the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, so we got a grant for our grants. Um, and uh, um, so that gives us $100,000. We've uh, spent maybe around 28000 of that, so have a, a pretty good chunk left as we move towards um, requirements that would go into effect at the end of October. Um, so again, just uh, timeline, public comment period ends on May 18th. Um, our ordinance will go to City Council on June 29th, um, and then it will take effect on October 31st. Uh, and then I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the code or the process, and certainly um, you know, during the public comment period, feel free to contact me directly. My contact info is on this sheet and also on the inside cover of the, the code language. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes, Andre. Um, first, I see there's penalties, um, potentially. Um, what could they be? I mean, how much? So um, the penalty component, there can be liens placed, and there's a number of criteria, but I'm asking what could be the value? The value. So that should be, that's in there um, on page five. Uh, so there's kind of two tiers, so there's, there would be infractions, uh, for example, of uh, not posting your site with the, the signage. So that would be kind of a minor infraction, and so a first violation might be a, a, a fine up to $500. The, the worst case scenario is where a project is required to deconstruct, they completely ignore that, and they hire a mechanical demolition contractor, and they scrape the building. Um, the, that contractor could stand to gain a substantial amount of money by taking one approach versus the other. So we need a substantial penalty um, in place to guard against that. So the improper use of mechanical equipment could have a fine up to up to ten thousand dollars, not necessarily ten thousand, but um, the delta between a really large project that deliberately ignores the the requirements could stand to gain easily that much. And then we have an, a, an appeal process as well. So um, it, sometimes there's misunderstandings. Um, we may have different documentation or something like that. Um, and there would be an appeal process first through the director and then to the code hearings officer. Okay. And then um, for minority contracting um, and certification, you're, how are you working that? So the, the consultant that we've hired has experience um, in workforce development, specifically taking a high road approach. So she uh, helped uh, the Bureau of Plan and Sustainability when we were developing the Clean Energy Works program. Um, and so we'll take a similar approach. The, the meeting that we'll have on the 18th, we've um, extended invitations to Women in Trades, Constructing Hope, a um, number of different organizations that represent the priorities that we're um, looking towards. And then we'll, we'll also um, rely on her for uh, a plan in terms of both um, having folks trained, but then also the hiring of those folks. Okay. So, um, but that's workforce. So I'm talking about the companies that will be certified. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, probably the, the most direct way to, to point to that is um, city of Portland are the projects that we do, so occasionally the city will take down buildings. Um, we have a, a prime contractor development program, which are MWESB certified firms um, that typically uh, are, they are the pool that, that does the work for a demolition or a deconstruction. Um, we're working very closely with them to 
have the, those contractors in that pool trained in deconstruction and then to become certified deconstruction contractors. So there's a pool of about, I think, 20 or 30 contractors that could potentially express interest in that. So that's, that's a almost guaranteed pool, um, but then we'll also do outreach to other existing demolition companies um, and there'll be a path that they can follow to get grandfathered in as far as certification goes. Okay. One last question. Um, the, the material that comes out of here, is there a market for it? There is. So we, we have a really strong market locally, um, and, and that market extends up and down the West Coast nationally and even internationally. So uh, from an international standpoint, it's not something that we promote. Um, you know, taking something out of a building and then shipping it overseas to Japan might not have the best uh, carbon footprint, but um, there are uh, buyers that will come over from Japan and walk through the rebuilding center and uh, hire a couple of containers and ship literally their entire stock of doors or lighting back to Japan. But here locally, it's it's a, a really strong design aesthetic. It's hard to go into um, a, a new tenant improvement or a restaurant or bar and not see some sort of salvage component because that, that wood that comes out of these buildings is really high quality old growth fir um, and you can you can make it as rustic as you want or you can make it as clean and modern as you want so there's a we're less concerned about the demand for this material and more concerned that there'll be the labor to actually salvage it thank you go ahead Eli and then sure. Maggie and Gary <clears throat> would there be any differential permitting fees for this versus traditional demolition? Not at this point. Um, so uh, permit fees typically are just cost recovery. Um, it, it's possible that with do, right now there are no real inspections for demolitions. There's just one at the, the end, right? So that will still end up happening. We'll do random inspections, so one could argue there's an additional cost we should have that accounted for, and a deconstruction permit should cost more than a demolition permit. And that's not the message we want to send. Um, so, right. So, um, so I, I would encourage not to have any more, even though there is a pre application, a pre start meeting, and random, there's clearly more staff time involved in this. So, my hope is that the fee schedule would not reflect that. Exactly. Um, and, and then the other questions, I think, under the answer, I want to confirm if you're de deconstructing a 1940 building, this would not apply. That's correct. So and you could still deconstruct as just this. But you don't have to go through this regulatory process if you exactly. voluntarily deconstruct one. Right. Um, and then if you took a 1906 building and you demoed it, except for leaving one wall up, this would also not apply. Right. So we rely, we rely on BDS's definition and enforcement of right. what where the line is drawn between a demolition and a major remodel. Okay. And then I wanted to follow up. Um, the last time I was here at PSC, Eli, you had asked a question about tipping fees and whether or not that was a tool to use. And I, I, I followed up with my colleague at Metro and, and similar to BDS fees, tipping fees take the same approach where it's a cost recovery um, type of situation. And so that's l less of a, um, an easy idea, I guess. <laughs> okay, Maggie. So I have a few questions. Um, back to the penalty, is it, I mean, are there, would someone be uh, someone demol demolishing a building save substantially more than ten thousand dollars? And if so, does that penalty need to be re that ceiling need to be reevaluated? Right. I think um, if we're talking about just houses, which we are houses and duplexes, um, it, it would probably have to be something like a, a mansion or that would exceed that. That cost difference. I mean, we're we're typical for the average the average size demolition is around twelve thirteen hundred square feet. Um, the cost differential between demolition and deconstruction um, might be six thousand dollars. So, uh, and I would say that the ten thousand dollar number at this point is a working number. It's certainly something that will get discussed as we move forward in drafting the final code language. I chime in over that. I just priced these um, deconstruction versus demolition, and I would say actually from that's probably accurate for this the split. Um, but the real thing, reason the developer is not going to want to do the penalty is the stop work order, like because we need you want to start building something right afterwards, and that's what a developer would probably 
that's probably the better hook. Right. And so we do have that provision in there for a stop work order in those situations. It becomes a little tricky. Um, you know, BDS can do stop work orders under this code language. Our director could initiate a stop work order. Um, there'll have to be some coordination, I think, between the two bureaus. If, uh, let's say, a mechanical piece of equipment has knocked down half a building and half of it's standing, and we say, wait, stop. Uh, we've got a potentially hazardous situation where it may just need to come down and then we'll sort through the, the penalties later. Um, oh, I, go ahead. Okay. So just curiosity, is a consultant from Portland or Oregon? Yes. Okay. And then third. Um, so I think is if, if, if we look in aggregate, when we look at or when we look at MWESB, a majority of those are white men, emerging small businesses. So I'm curious how you would get around that with this program, really to target as you did with the training program. Um, and then if there's any, if you can incorporate any required subcontracting so that, I mean, if you have a project large enough, you have someone moving up through the ranks, a smaller business that needs to build that capacity uh, and build that project portfolio. Right. Um, and, you know, I would say that I can't fully answer that at this point just because we're just getting started with those those conversations. But um, preliminary, preliminary ones that we've had, we would uh, potentially rely on local organizations. So let's say Women in Trades or Constructing Hope. They would identify folks that are in their existing program to participate in the the let's call it the class of 2016 so we might identify that we need 30 people in order to meet the increased labor demand um, they would go through a, a training program um, we would we're going to identify sources of funding to help cover that then there would be an on-the-job training component, almost an apprenticeship type program. Um, and I know at, at a minimum the rebuilding center is interested in hosting that. Um, they would pay for part of their wages and then um, we'd identify other sources to essentially supplement supplement that. So um, I think the, the first part is going to be identifying who that class is um, and then they will be the ones that follow through the program and are going to be the most likely to be to be hired. Gary, um, <clears throat> the fact sheet mentions um, grandfathering of existing um, practitioners for deconstruction, and I didn't see corresponding language in the code. Did I just miss it, or can you point it no, out? No. So uh, one of the things that you know will kind of ride on the, the coattails of the code language will be administrative rules. Um, and so those admin rules will detail that. Um, also, since it's part of the, the training component of it, we're still having those conversations. But the, the BMRA, the Building Material Reuse Association, they have uh, training for both the kind of the contractors or the firms um, as well as the, the laborers. And then they have a way to grandfather in um, existing practitioners. So they still, they can kind of skip the, the classroom component. They still need to go out in the field and demonstrate proficiency at certain things. So let's say uh, removing a window, um, and then they need to pass an exam. Then for the for the uh, for the contractors, the certified deconstruction contractors, they're required to demonstrate 2,000 hours of actual deconstruction experience, and so they would be able to report that retroactively. So a lot of those details will be in the admin rules and. Um, in here, I've kind of indicated in several places where that additional detail that's more procedural um, and less code oriented will be found. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, does uh, do the, does the code not have to have an authorization for that grandfathering? I uh, well. It, Again, the, the admin rules would supplement it, um, so I don't see that it needs to be in the actual code language, especially if it's something that is might change in the future. So today, as I sit before you, I'm saying we want to use BMRA, we want to use this training. 
here's the criteria. Um, we may go through this and find that that's not the best approach and maybe there's another organization or we want to develop our own uh, code requirements. We wouldn't necessarily want to go back to city council and ask permission to change the code. We could do that um, as part of the admin rule process and it would still be a public process but it would be at the bureau level and the director level as opposed to city council. Yeah, my underlying concern is that there's at least one large not-for-profit that has been in the deconstruction and salvage business for a long time. Right. And um, I'm concerned that they remain eligible under this. Have they, have they been? Have, it, you're concerned that they would be ineligible or? We're talking about rebuilding center. Right. Have, have they been part of the conversation on this? Yes, most definitely. They'll, they'll likely be the, the entity that does the most hiring for this, so they'll they'll be one of the first folks that shows up to, to get certified. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Teresa. So I'm curious if you have some plans for tracking the materials and sort of creating the story of the success so that we can, one, save stuff and then start going for younger buildings if it's working well. Right, so the, um, the requirement to submit a, a pre-deconstruction form on the front end as well as the tail end will help us start to build that. Um, there's a lot of parallels between what we're doing in the code language and what we're doing with our deconstruction grant program. So there were a number of goals with the deconstruction grant program. One was we could learn from it, but we could also, uh, and we can incent um, certain behavior, uh, reward innovations, but a lot of it was data gathering, and that's proved to be one of the more valuable components. So we now have information on costs and number of hours and lessons learned and information about further encountering hazardous materials. Um, so I think that that approach has worked well for that, and we'll, we'll use a lot of that um, in the actual requirements so that we can report on here's the, the amount of materials that were, were saved and um, hopefully expand this going forward. This may be more of a question for Susan. Um, so this is going to be administered by BPS, uh, and I certainly get the sustainability connection, but it just seemed to me reading the code that a lot of the day-to-day -day activities involved in this are things that uh, BDS does on a regular basis, and was there any pro-con on which bureau should administer this? I can answer I'll that. I'll let him answer most of it. Part of it is also <laughs> that, and maybe you can talk about our similar relationship we have with other solid waste issues. Okay. Um, so uh, when, we, when we first started talking about code language, we worked pretty closely with BDS and, and first identifying where the code language should live. And there were, there were three obvious options, but we ended up distilling it down to where we're at now. Um, the first one was the zoning code. Um, and we agreed this wasn't the best place for that. The other one was Title 24, which is the building code, and that's where the existing demolition delay and notification requirements are housed. Um, and if you read the, the purpose statement of, of that title, um, this would seem to fit in there fairly neatly. Um, they argued that it really isn't, um, e even the, uh, the demolition delay and notification requirements probably shouldn't have been there, but there was a legacy of 20 years of it being there, and so they kept it there. Um, so that left us with Title 17, which is where there's a lot of things in Title 17, but um, notably the, uh, our solid waste and recycling requirements are in there, um, ban the bag is in there, energy benchmarking is in there. Um, this would follow that. Um, Unfortunately, when I, I sent this uh, copy of this to the auditor's office, their first comment was, well, the, the section you're using is reserved for the uh, vehicle tax. Um, <laughs> and so in order, it'll go solid waste and recycling, ban the bag, energy benchmarking, vehicle tax, deconstruction. Um, and uh, BDS, um, you know, I think they're a, a willing partner in all of this, but they're from a, a life safety standpoint, this doesn't necessarily fit in directly with their their purview, so they're more interested, especially with, in terms of expertise um, and having BPS do the enforcement component of this. Any other questions? Oh, Eli, yes. I have one more idea. Um, <clears throat> so this is 1916 or earlier buildings, and it's 2016 right now, um, and you talked about when this was first presented that this might 
be adjusted to later years based on building the capacity. Right. Might you consider changing the language so that this applies to any building 100 years old and then it will automatically creep? We, we had, you would be amazed at the extent that we talked about that in our advisory group. <laughs> and I, um, just as an aside, I was in support of that because there would be an automatic kind of creep factor um, in there. But we, we ultimately decided let's keep it 2016 and then in future phases expand that. And, and you know, again, uh, the 2016 was really, there, there was some uh, nostalgia in it being 100 years old, but more importantly, it related to approximately one third of demolition. So that was a, a reasonable first bite to, to take off. But um, now I lost on that one. Um, just a follow up on the workforce. So the workers are trained, they're required to be hired by the certified firms, is that correct? They, they wouldn't be required, so it'll still be a, an open market, but if you were a, a certified deconstruction contractor and you're, um, you'd like to expand your uh, employers, employees, um, an obvious choice would be to look at this program and see who has participated and graduated. They are going to be um, more readily uh, adaptable to come on site um, and work safely and proficiently versus hiring someone that's completely green off the street, doesn't have any experience in this. So they'll, they would be a preferred, just all things equal, they would be a preferred hire over someone else. Okay, and there's no requirement for the contractor to have certified workers. The, at least one, so the way the, we have the code written right now, um, at least one person from that firm needs to be a certified deconstruction contractor and the entire firm is considered a certified right. firm. And, and that's most likely going to be the owner or Possibly. because they, they're the ones that have to get certified. Correct? Right. So it's kind of similar to um, um, just, I mean, just the, the trades industry. It's not necessarily that everyone is um, certified or licensed, but someone's overseeing that project that is. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you right. very much. Thank you. I really and, appreciate and it. Again, feel free to contact me directly if you have any questions or have more chance to look at this. And when will we be back for a vote on this? Uh, for, uh, a city Council. So are you going to come back here or are you just going to go directly to Council? I was planning on going directly to Council. I don't mind coming back here. Um, everyone's um, really friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so when um, when will this go to council? I'm just so we'll, I'm asking we'll, these questions to provide clarification for yes. the group. So we'll go to city council on June 29th. Um, I have to file documents on May 26th, um, and so the the public comment period ends on the 18th. So I have between the 18th and the 16th to um, finalize everything. So my question to the group then is whether or not you want to do a letter any kind of recommendation letter from the group here? If there's a group of one or two or three who wants to put that together, um, we can do that and get it around to the group. Uh, it's not required, it's not a land use change, so you don't have to do that, um, unlike most things that come through here, but I think it, if there is agreement, it would be a useful thing to have. I'd certainly be supportive of that. It'd be nice to include the fee neutralness of it because that's left out of the proposal. A lot of other costs. Okay. Great. And, and who is pushing for not? Who's <laughs> pushing for not going in, in year by year? The one hundred year old thing. Um, it was pretty. It was balanced. Um, I think the the development community was interested just from a due diligence standpoint, so it was easier for them to just have a date and not. Constantly having to do subtraction, um, and because <laughs> those developers are pretty dunces out here. Yeah, <laughs> jeez. Um, and then, uh, and then some of the the, the salvage community um, also felt that uh, it was a good approach. And let's let's it, it, from year to year, it would grow at a minimum of three percent. But I think everybody wants to take a more guarded approach, and let's wait and see and make sure everything's successful and. Um, and then take a measured step later. Just one comment. 
Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. I, I like the 2016 approach just because I'd be worried about people rushing to avoid the flip every year. So that's why I would start out this way. Um, so Michael just reminded me the, uh, the way the resolution read, um, and then also um, on the back of this uh, two-pager, the, uh, the timeline. Uh, originally, we were planning on going back to city council a year after the effective date, so October 2017, with an update on the requirements, how things are going, were there any growing pains, do we need to adjust the code, were there loopholes that we didn't think about. Um, and then we'd come back in another year, so two years from the effective date, and look at raising the bar. Um, the, the mayor's interested in potentially having more established goals, um, so not necessarily codified, but um, after year one, let's, let's have a goal of trying to get to 1925, and then the next year, to 1930 and then the next year to 1940 and, and again those those years would coincide with what is happening in the marketplace in terms of the number of demolitions in those age categories so potentially taking essentially a, a like a 10 percent increase every year but not not codifying it but rather having a, an established goal well i have to say i also support leaving it at, at 16 right now um, and seeing how it goes and i would say i'd like to see you come back in a year, not to us as well, not just council, and kind of let us know where you, how you think the program did, and um, we can help shape maybe perhaps a letter to council at that point to let them know what we think the next goal should be. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is solid waste rates. Almost back on time. All right, good evening. I'm Michael Armstrong. I manage the sustainability programs for the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. With me is Bruce Walker, who leads our solid waste recycling composting programs. So this is the, the first year of the PSC taking on its role, recommending rates for residential curbside collection to city council. We were here in September with a, a sort of an introduction and orientation to the issue. Um, and we are back here today uh, to share with you the first glimpse of what will likely become the proposed rate um, for the most common, whoops. And that was it. Um, so, um, so I will just provide very quick orientation and then I'll turn it over to Bruce to share a couple of the key factors that are you know, all processed into this recommended rate for you to discuss. And then we will come back at your next meeting once we've got a little more information, the rates are fleshed out. So this is, um, again, sort of providing the building blocks, but also giving you the, the first public glimpse of what the proposed rate for the most common service lef level will likely be. So just as a, as a reminder, um, we have a very different system for collecting garbage, recycling, composting on the commercial side than the residential. Commercial, by which we mean businesses, but also multifamily properties of five units or more, or excuse me, of more than five units. Uh, commercial is about three quarters of the waste stream, so the lion's share of the waste is there. Customers get to choose their hauler. We set rules. Uh, we receive a per ton fee that helps us run programs to support businesses, but we do not set rates and we do not divide the city up into geographic districts, so businesses get to choose their hauler. What we'll talk about today is on the uh, what we call residential curbside, so single family up through fourplex. Uh, we do have geographic service territories for that. Haulers are franchised. There are extensive rules about how they need to provide that service, and very significantly, the city sets the rates. Uh, within those rates, there's a, a franchise fee that you'll see as we talk about the numbers that comes to the city to help run programs to support recycling, composting, and waste reduction. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bruce to uh, go through the factors in the rate making and then share this initial look at what rates are likely to be for next year. Our office oversees 14 haulers who provide the residential uh, uh, services throughout the community. We receive their financial reports 
hire a, an independent CPA to review the books, their financial records to us, and we, we that's part of the the uh, formulation that we're coming to to you tonight. Here are some of the key factors that we go through as we look at, obviously, labor, the drivers on the routes, the, the fuel costs, and we take a look at those actual costs, and in a moment, I'm going to compare those against what's in the current rate that, that uh, was established last year. There's, always, there's also garbage disposal costs, uh, what the haulers are actually picking up from the individual households, as well as the fees that are charged when they deliver those materials to the transfer stations that are operated by Metro. There are charges for both garbage and the next item, the yard debris and food scraps, also includes charges for disposal of that material. Recycled materials typically have brought in uh, a, a slight amount of revenue for our program, for the program. Uh, right now, markets, quite frankly, are at a very low point, so that's not an a aspect that is bringing in uh, revenue into the program, but we're going to roll it all up in a rate for you in just a moment. What I've listed on the last line is incentives and disincentives, and that's some of our policy that we'll be coming to you at our next meeting to discuss how we can incent customers to reduce less waste, and one of the mechanisms that was described in the memo we provided it is the incentive to go to a smaller can, such as a mini can or less frequent every four week garbage service versus a disincentive premium we put on the larger garbage cans, carts, the 60 and 90 gallon carts. That's a, that's a placeholder just to be aware. We'll be coming back with policy recommendations on what those incentives and disincentives should be. Where we are right now is to look at the most common service uh, uh, level, which is a 35-gallon cart. There's 43% of our customer base is in that. Now, we've broken out what some of these, the primary costs are, the cost centers that are shown by uh, on this table uh, in the major categories. So the red bars are what's in the current rate, and now we're comparing the, with some of the, uh, the reviewed financial records. Well, what are the haulers actually expending over the past year, and what might some of the adjustments be based on whether it's a metro tip fee increase or the uh, haulers' labor contracts to uh, increase driver wages. So. These are some of the factors that play into these categories. The first three, solid waste, recycling, composting, that's the operational side of the business. And you can see there's, there's very slight adjustments there. Um, I'm going to roll up with some more a, a table in just a moment to categorize this. But I wanted to give a sense to you that we're taking a very careful look at these operational concerns. There's also the general administrative costs, which include the, the management, the office staff, those who undertake the customer calls, billing calls in the GNA category. The two columns to the right, or the two tables to the right, the operating margin, that's the target 9.5% operating margin that is incorporated in the franchise agreement with the hauler. And the franchise fee is the 5% of, of gross revenue that comes back to BPS to fund our programs and outreach efforts. I have a quick question. What is the uh, unit associated with this? Is this time per cart, per what? It, this is broken down on a monthly customer basis. Thank you for reminding me. So is part of the monthly bill that would go to the customer. So how do all these add up looking forward? 
So proposed rates, different. This is an annual rate review. So we received their hauler financial records for 2015. Those are submitted to our office in early March, and then we do the CPA review that and make some adjustments looking forward for the upcoming fiscal year, July 2016 through June 2017. You better believe it. That is right. <laughs> that is right. And so. Is your term? <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought she was pretty interested in it, and because she saw over in the far right column that we are proposing a rate decrease for uh, residential customers, and as we've taken a look at the range of service. Uh, everything from a mini can up to a 90 gallon cart, we are going to project and come back to you at the May 10th hearing to uh, that there would be a slight rate decrease. Now, I don't want to overstate this, but we're taking into consideration some inflationary factors. We're also taking into consideration some increases in disposal costs at Metro facilities for, for the compost and uh, solid waste that's delivered. However, hauler operational efficiencies, they're, they're spending less time at each stop, as well as the low fuel costs, those things add up across the different components. And we are projecting, or we are proposing a 20 cent per month decrease for our most common service level. I'd be happy to so answer. So that doesn't <laughs> sound like much, but if you look at water and sewer and other, your phone bill, anything else, we've done this now. This is our fourth year in the row that we've either stayed flat or reduced rates. And it is an amazing partnership, sort of this public-private partnership of working with a group of private haulers. Um, and uh, they've been amazing, really, in terms of their efficiency. Okay, so the last time we talked about this, I went home and I looked at my trash bill. I was like, oh. So my trash bill, I have a 35-gallon cart. It's $48, and there is no detail. So... So we... <laughs> now, my guess is you might have an even smaller cart, and it's... Right. It may be a mini can, and you're receiving a bill, typically the hauler's bill, every two months. And so, <laughs> again, not to, no, I'm not, it's a very common question that our office receives. So we, we break it out in the monthly rate, and typically the haulers are sending bills for covering two-month periods. But it's worth checking. Yes. <laughs> and if it, if, if not. you know who to call. Okay. So the reduction here seems to be really in the composting. Is that a, a result of the com increased composting from customers, or is that just efficiency, or is it a combination of um, in the com composting reduction? So is it because are we composting more, which is gaining some efficiencies that is reducing our costs, or is it just efficiency of the haulers in understanding composting better? My response would be it, there's greater efficiency in the collection that's spread really over all three of those categories. However, the solid waste is we've lumped in the collection component from the hauler and the disposal, and the disposal is going up at, uh, of the solid waste. The, the recycling markets aren't quite as good. The, the recycling collection is efficient. And then the composting is where it's coming out and it's be, becoming more evident 
just in this table in that uh, with uh, reflecting the hauler efficiency. So it's, it's not like all their operations, they have not achieved some of the efficiencies. It, it's just that efficiency isn't quite as evident in this table in the but, other categories. But it's not a result of us composting more. I mean, customers, the city residential customers composting more and creating a volumetric equation and composting. It, what I'm trying to get at is if, if we, if we, if the composting is doing more and more and we, you get to incentives, mm -hmm. disincentives next time, if, if it's a good deal to compost and we can reduce costs and that's driving our costs down, then we ought to incent it more. Mm -hmm. If it's not getting us any benefit, I, I'm trying to understand that before I have to decide on incentives. It really is pulling it out of the garbage can, okay. which is a much, it's almost twice as much the disposal cost. So that's where the benefit would be uh, in, in terms of incenting customers to re switch any habits that put food scraps in the garbage can if they're put in the compost cart. It's a lower disposal fee. The, the efficient collection system is already there for it. Go ahead and add. Yeah, so I think what I'd suggest is let, why don't we come back at the next meeting because these individual rows actually kind of collapse several different factors. You know, the thing that drives rates down across the board is producing less waste in the first place. Yeah. You then get to moving things out of the garbage, the top row, into composting also is a savings. And so each of these, um, Several of those factors are potentially going on at the same time that you also have increased hauler efficiencies, lower fuel costs, et cetera. And so disaggregating some of that, I think we can come back and highlight a couple of things that are clear from the numbers that get rolled up here. Okay. What, Thank you. One of the things that might be helpful is just to say the different tip rates for garbage versus composting. The, the garbage tip rate is 96.25 and the uh, per ton. I, uh, and compost is 63 per ton. So it, there's a substantial difference to divert and put that material in the compost cart. Um, I, I noted that the, um, the tipping fee for for yard debris and compost went up by about four bucks per ton or seven percent. Does that have to do with the um, difficulty of incorporating food straps into the waste stream and the, the challenges they've had with that? Well, it it reflects the two primary facilities, compost facilities, operational costs. And one of them is in North Plains, and the other is further down the Willamette Valley, uh, south of Monmouth. So the, it gets to their operational costs. It, all the material is delivered to Metro transfer stations, and Metro sets these rates uh, that include the transfer to those two facilities and arranging or working with those facilities to develop those tip fees. So it's it's a reflection of the cost. Though those facilities have put in additional um, uh, aeration units and uh, other considerations, uh, operational considerations at the facilities to address bringing in the food scraps and making it into a valuable soil amendment. Um, do you know how this compares to the commercial rates for the same apples to apples? Uh, companion question. It's sometimes hard to count units. You walk around, it's hard to tell if it's four or five units in a building. It takes some sleuthing. I'm just curious how you guys make the determination or does the owner make the determination because there's probably no checking going on. Well, our office works very... It, our program within 
VPS, we're working very close with our tech services staff that we know the individual properties on a tax lot. So we, if, if there were, would be any question, we're, we're going to go to the, the source documents and identify what the, are, are they part of our franchise system that is a, say a fourplex or is this a fiveplex or larger that could get the commercial services? In terms of how much, in terms of how much they're paying, uh, because we don't set commercial rates, they're negotiated between the you know, manager of the unit, so we don't know. And I can, I'd be willing to bet you a lot of money that some of them pay a lot more than comparable single family rates and probably some are out there that pay less. You might also talk a little bit about how small commercial buildings then also, um, we, we looked at this issue because it's, I don't know, 10 years ago, there was a push to think about, should we have commercial franchise? And at that time we realized that um, because obviously if you have more demand, you're a big customer, you're gonna get a better rate than if you're a small store and you have once a week pickup and you know we were beginning to just by survey look and realize that those small businesses were often paying more than if they had just been a you know a, a large house and so um, we offer that for what size business anybody who can basically meet the 60 90 gallon can at the top they can get the commercial rate or the residential rate a little a little is a terribly common but I want to touch on just schedule we will be back here at your May 10th meeting with recommendations for our full set of rates from mini can through the 90 gallon cart we will be preparing uh, to take that to council the following week so it's a fairly tight schedule as you've heard we received the financial reports in March. We're here in April. We'll be back at the start of May and then to council in mid-May, and the rates will take effect on July 1st. So process questions, this is our first time through, and this was previously done by the PERB, is that right? Um, is that meeting on May 10th a public hearing, or what's the format of our decision making? So first time through, um, my expectation is that that meeting is a public hearing. The haulers, for sure, are interested in sharing their opinions, and, and it's important for you to hear them as well. And there are sometimes members of the public. And the PERB did a public hearing on these? They had public, they did not, well, I think they They accepted they public testimony, but it, it wasn't a hearing, per se. Hmm. Okay. And historically, it's the haulers that come and speak their minds. They're, they're the, the one constant, uh -huh. and then sometimes others. <laughs> they okay. have an and interest I, in this. I think when they, in the early years, there was also quite a number of recycling advocates, composting advocates, before everything really got going to, in, in order to look at how the rates were set. Um, the markets, as, as Bruce mentioned, maybe he can, he'll talk about it more at, when we have the final list, is the markets really go up and down. And so there are times when um, the way we set the rates where when the markets are high, you could, you could have as much as 2 or $3 per month subtracted from the price it would have been otherwise off the thing, off of the rates because of the, of the recycling markets being so high. Um, but when it's low, there, it's a pretty small amount, um, but we're still having a rate reduction, so. Teresa? So that was gonna be my question. Are the haulers happy with this process and the numbers, or they're going to be complaining? They, they've been a very good partner over the years in working. Uh, they would describe the process that we have established. I think they would use the words fair, that it, it takes into consideration their costs, their operations, and as Susan was referring to, taking a look at some of the recycling markets. They, they are, uh, they, if they are to show up here, I'm certain there'll be at least a couple of them, 
when you get in a discussion with them, you would find that they would have a lot of insights and it wouldn't be just be here to complain type thing. So I, I don't want to set a stage like it might be kind of a dicey discussion, but instead it would be, uh, I think they would convey the, the long-term working, working relationship we've had with the Bureau and establishing programs and really making some significant program changes, most recent in 2011 when we instituted the food scrap program and every other week garbage. So these are big steps. There have been significant program changes, and they've been part of this process of delivering services to customers. And they would certainly be open to answering any questions you had. And, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, I have a quick question. You were commenting that part of the reduction, perhaps just a small part, is due to lower fuel costs. Um, so is there a, since you're setting this for the year, correct? Mm -hmm. And so if fuel costs rise, is there some kind of buffer built into kind of what you determine there? How, how is that kind of arrived at? That's an excellent question. So we look at, first of all, what we're comparing against is what what is in the current rates that are being paid today. And it's, it's and, um estimate for what's the fuel portion. Then we look at, well, what were their actual fuel costs last year? And not surprisingly, those were lower. We also do a forward look, which is getting to your question, and we use information from the Energy Information Association that provides projections on fuel. So it's taking actual costs, which are lower, and it still has a pretty low I, I don't know if I can get my fingers close enough to, in terms of where the projections for fuel are over the course of the next, uh, well, it's really 18 months from the end of 2015 when the hauler actual financials are in to um, forward to the end of next fiscal year. So it's projection of actual costs. And then one more kind of tie to that, should something crazy happen, is there a mechanism for them to have an emergency, like, oh my, it increased by five bucks a gallon? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there, yes, there is an emergency clause in the franchise agreement, but let's just say fuel went way up and we said, oh gosh, we should look at it. But we wouldn't just look at one component. Because we would assume, or I would believe, that as fuel went up, likely recycling markets would pick up. They, all the, the, plast, mm -hmm. the market for plastics right now is super low. So we would not be coming back to you. In all likelihood, we're not going to be coming back to you with any, be, any emergency uh, um, changes to this. But if something happened that caused a, a us to take a look at it, we would not look at just one line item that was in isolation mm -hmm. from everything else. Makes sense. Yes, Eli. So should we think of this as like a regulated monopoly? Yeah. Uh, okay, but it, with a little twist that if an operator decided, I hate this system, they could just walk, right? They could decide I'm just doing commercial um, or they're under a contract where they have to perform for the whole year or could they just say, I'm out of here and then you guys would bid out that piece of the franchise to somebody else? How does how does can someone, can someone just say, take it or leave it, and just say, I don't really like what you guys are doing here. I'm just going to do commercial hauling from now on. They, they could. Um, what, what happens in actual reality is that they sell their franchise to another company okay. because it is a way to make money, and so yeah, there's value to that. So 15 years ago, there were 35 or more right. haulers. So this has happened over the years as people have gotten out of the business, they're selling to each other. We have a floor or a ceiling that no one operator can have more than 40% of the market so that we don't. So it's encouraging small <coughs> business. Other cities have one hauler or they might have two or three. Um, we've continued to 
there's still a lot of family businesses, um, and we've continued to support that. Gary? Um, about how many households are covered by the residential program? 150,000. 150,000. Okay. Solid waste and recycling rates <laughs> rather than widgets. <laughs> It is very interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I would take this class. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Michael and Bruce. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Short break. There's been a request for a short break. We'll come back here in five minutes.
get going, Deborah. Uh, okay. Next on the agenda is residential and open space zoning map. This is a work session. Great, so thank you. Um, I'm Deborah Stein, principal planner, um, and I'm joined tonight by my team who we're gonna be doing um, sort of a joint presentation tonight because they've all been working on this so hard. So I have Chris Garzello, our East District Liaison, sitting next to me, and in succession <coughs> we'll have um, Joan, well, not in the, not in this order, but Joan Fredrickson, who's our West District liaison, Marty Stockton, Southeast, Nan Stark is Northeast. Um, Leslie Lum is not here tonight, she's North, and she's currently at a mixed-use zoning project uh, info session out at in Midland Library. And then we also have Tabitha Bachetti, who's been assisting all of us on all of the zoning work, so. Um, so we're here following up on our uh, public hearing that you held two weeks ago tonight on the residential and open space zoning map update. And just as a refresher, um, the March 2016 proposed draft of the uh, residential and open space zoning map update, um, we looked at four categories of zoning map changes. And so the first was to correspond with the 2035 comp plan map changes that are, as you know, at council right now um, for their votes on amendments. The second category was sort of the cleanup category to address miscellaneous situations such as split zones and things like that. The third, which we'll touch on a little bit tonight, is some zoning map changes that were designed to ease David Douglas School District overcrowding. And the fourth category, and the one that we've heard the most testimony about to date, are those zoning map changes that would match the comprehensive plan designations that were applied back in 1980. Um, I think that you've received something like 200 pieces of testimony, and that's including the testifiers at your hearing, but also map app, email, and letters. Um, we <laughs> summarized the testimony that we've received up till this point in the memo that um, is dated April 21st. And in that memo, we tried to group testimony by theme, just to help you start to digest what are the big issues, rather than you look at each and every piece of testimony one by one. We tried to group them in ways that you could start to see what the common themes are. And those are some of the things we'll be talking about with you tonight. Um, I think I wanna just touch on what I'm hoping to get out of tonight's work session. It's, um, we're looking for general direction from you um, to give us direction about what goes into the next iteration of the zoning map. So we're, as I mentioned last time, and I'll mention again, we're gonna be pulling together the residential and open space zoning cha changes along with the employment, the mixed use, and the campus institution all into one consolidated zoning map. And that's gonna have another round of public review and another public hearing. So what we're looking for you to do to offer us tonight is some provisional direction based on what you've heard so far, knowing there's more testimony coming in and knowing there'll be additional information, but based on what you've heard so far, we'd like some direction about what should go into that next zoning map. So if there are some changes from what, are in, what you see in the proposal that's um, in front of you now, you can give us some direction to make those changes and those will be incorporated into the composite zoning map that will be published in June. So again, we're kind of looking for nods, not an actual vote. It's nothing you're having to commit to long term. It's just the, what do we do next as staff? What would we want to make um, put into that map? So, um, so we're going to present to you some uh, some choices and some issues, and then ask for your direction, and, and then you could give us the direction as we run through some questions. Um, so what I um, propose for a structure for this work session tonight is first um, touch on uh, the questions and answers that I provided in the April 21st memo. I took the questions that you asked at the conclusion of the hearing and provided some written responses to those. So if there are any additional questions or follow-up questions, we can do that tonight. And then um, my staff and I are gonna lead you through some discussion questions where we're asking you to give us direction. And we're, we'll start with two general questions 
Um, and then we'll follow with five area-specific questions where we'll actually present you some background information, maps, and, and then ask you to give us some direction on the specific questions. Um, and at the co conclusion of that, we'll wrap up and talk about next steps. So that's, does that all sound good to you? And one thing I, I meant to mention a minute ago when I was saying that we're looking for direction from you, if there's um, a split kind of sentiment amongst you, if you're really not sure, I want to encourage you to err on the side of proposing a change that would go into that next version of the map because we want the public, both affected property owners and the general public, to have as much time and as many opportunities as possible to provide feedback. And it's easier to do that if there's something on the map that they can respond to. If we pull something off the map at this point, it's a lot harder to put it back. So, you know, if in doubt, err on the side of putting a change into the map so that everybody has yet another chance to, to weigh in. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so let me just start by asking if there are any follow-up questions you have to the Q&A that was in your April 21st. I, I don't think I need to go through all of these question and answers unless you'd like me to, but if you have some follow-up questions, I'm happy to start there. Were there any questions? Are you all reading it right now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing any questions. They might circle back later, but let's Happy to ahead. come back to them if we want to do it that way. Okay, so I guess we're ready. Is, are these questions on the whole Q&A, on the, the several questions that you answered for? Right, that's why I thought we'd start there. But we could also come back to them if you want to follow up later. So um, I, I have a couple on the related to the questions I posed last okay. time. Um, I was a little disappointed in the, um, one of the questions I had posed was the economic distribution of the, of the rezoning. And basically, you, you provided a pretty limited answer, which was around displacement of low-income tenants but really didn't, weren't able to take on the question of are these middle class and working class properties that are being, in, in, that are being swept up in this program as, uh, and is there any difference between properties and the rest of the city? And I'm, I, I'm wondering if there's not a way, you know, since we're not making a final decision tonight, I'm just wondering if there's, if there's not some way that we can take a look at that question a little bit more. My underlying concern is intergenerational wealth transmission. And that really, that's the way working people, working class people become middle class people. And if it disproportionately negatively affects that population, then I think there's a really deep policy issue here that we need to address. So I'm, you know, I, I'd be, mm -hmm. I will volunteer myself, you know, to work with y'all yeah. to try to figure out some methodology for for dealing with that question, but can, can you comment a little bit more on that? Yeah, no, I, and I think it's a really good question. One of the things that um, we hear in testimony is that some of the things we're proposing will diminish property value, and in fact, I think they might um, augment property, they might increase property value by allowing more options on a particular property. So for the wealth, um, you know, wealth creation for, for um, many, property owners, maybe long-time property owners who, who are middle class or lower income, but they're having the ability to do more with your property would actually increase their, their wealth creation, their wealth mm -hmm. potential. So it has, so I think in some cases, some of the um, comments about diminishing value are really a little bit of a w diminishing the character. It's, it's perceived as a diminished value, but it actually may increase the property value, um, even if it may not be a favored change for some people who are, who are opposed to the change. So it's a little bit of a mix. Um, we are very concerned about displacement. We're very concerned about making sure we look at any change that we propose that might prompt um, the displacement of tenants or of lower income um, residents in some ways. But I think that we really need to look at each area individually. There is a question you'll be seeing in, in the next slide that was posed about whether there's any racial composition that could be changed in a, in a transitioning neighborhood, maybe a previously a majority black neighborhood that may be shifting to majority white, and is there anything in this 
um, zoning change that might you know trigger that change and and we're looking at well how how are ways we'd love to to have more guidance on ways we could look at whether that zoning change by itself is actually prompting that kind of change yeah so if, if there's just some way that we can lay that out with a little bit more detail so we can say well if property values increase here's what's likely to happen and who's who's likely to benefit if they decrease here's what's likely to happen and here's here's who's likely to not benefit mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so j just so so we're one layer deeper than just kind of the principles of yeah. it might go one way or another. And, and one of the things that I put into that response that I would like to elaborate on um, as we gain more tools for evaluating this is um, I think we're directing ourselves to always look at who benefits and is who, who's mm -hmm. burdened by any change. And so we need to com continue to learn new um, evaluation tools to have that kind of data and that kind of evaluation so that we're always applying that that question into our evaluation of, of any land use change that we propose. So okay. I do appreciate the question. So Thanks. And Deborah, I'll, tied to that, is there empirical data that you have that kind of tracks, yeah, if you take something that's R5 now and make it R2.5, it's an increase or a decrease? Because I'm <clears throat> sure everyone's coming at it, like you said, with their own yeah. thought of, some people are thinking now I've got more density, mm -hmm. therefore it should be worth more. And there's mm -hmm. other people thinking now I have an apartment next to me, therefore it's worth less. You know, my my property is worth less in their opinion. Yeah, so um, we've we have asked um, our economics team to to give us some some data, so we're not just going on anecdotal you know information when and we are looking at that. I think some of it's situational and location specific, but I think that we could probably come back with some some better data to look at examples and case studies to to evaluate Great. that Thank in, you. A, in a better way. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Megan. I'm curious how you're tracking um, displacement of tenants, because from my understanding, it's actually really hard to track evictions, let alone no yeah. cause eviction. Yeah, we, we did not track, we, we don't have a way that I know of to actually track that what we were doing was using some sort of generalized assumptions about looking at the ratio in any given zoning review area of the owner occupancy versus the um, renter occupancy. And in areas that were predominantly renter occupied, we were much more cautious about proposing a zone change because we knew that if we did propose a zone change in a heavily renter occupied area, it wouldn't be the residents who are making a decision about what to do with the property, it would be somebody else. So there's much more vulnerability to displacement under that circumstance. But in a zoning review area where it was predominantly owner occupied, then we assume that the people making the decision, do I leave my property as is or do I redevelop, are the people who, who are living there so there's not gonna be a trigger of displacement of so to, the okay. immediate area. Now whether there's a, a ripple effect is much more, hard, much more difficult yeah. too. So to follow up on Gary's request, it might be interesting to kind of show that if you haven't already, like if we could, for me it would be incredibly helpful just to see where those renter Majority renter occupied mm -hmm. areas versus home mm -hmm. In the report, um, is it already? Uh, let's see. It was in the actual um, March proposal, oh. where we um, we have a page or two about each of the zoning review areas where we're proposing a zone change. We do have that data. What it doesn't show is similar data for all the areas where we said let's not make the let's not propose a change. But um, sort of by definition, if they made it into the proposal as a proposed area for a zoning change, then those were the um, more heavily owner-occupied areas. But we do have the, the, the data for all the other areas as well. It's just not in the report. Go ahead. Um, I understand if something's zoned R2.5 in the comp plan, but R5 current zoning, you can switch it from R5 to 2.5 through this process, and I generally like seeing that happen when I can. Can you make it go to R3 as a proposal? Because I will give it a little pitch. R3 is a very flexible zoning category. <laughs> it's it's maybe Chris's it favorite zone. <laughs> I think it's, I wish we had so much more R3 in this town, and it's in between those things. It's maybe less threatening to the R5 zone, and I've got a project I'm doing in R3, and it's, it's, it's just great. So I guess I, the, the question is, do you have the latitude that this process proposed himself to go to R3 
Um, instead of R5, uh, instead of R2.5? Instead of R2.5, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, you know, we, we, could, we could do that. Because again, we, if, if that were the, the um, sense of the group and that's a proposal we want to make a change to, then we, that would show up in the next iteration of the zoning map and that would be... So, so that is playing with the map, though. It's, it's, yeah. it, it does impact the comp plan map. But oh, you, you oh, do. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joan just corrected me. <laughs> yes, thank you, Joan. Um, with the R5 to R2.5, we're matching the comprehensive plan designation. We, we are not able at this point to change the comprehensive plan designation from R2.5 to R3 in Even order to match. Yeah. So it goes back, to, so it gets embroiled in the city yeah. council process rather than yeah. just this aligning yeah. things process. So that, yeah, yeah, so and, I'm, yeah. And I was gonna say that I agree with you. I like R3, but you have to remember that some of these R5 our 2.5 lots are 5,000 square feet, so our three doesn't really work for them. So it would be more appropriate where it does work, where you have a bigger, big enough lot to get two or more properties. So, but yeah, our three. <laughs> um, so f did you have one? No, go ahead. Uh, so another question that wasn't included. Um, I think it sounds like staff was working on a proposal or a study to see if um, keeping the designation and holding back um, the upzoning could be a potential mechanism to capture value through permitting or mm -hmm. um, a land use decision. Um, so I'm curious how that would apply to this, mm -hmm. to the residential. So we did look at that. Um, for various scenarios, and, and I think that we're still looking at the value capture idea, and you know we're looking now at inclusionary housing and, and linkage fees and so forth. Where that idea doesn't really play out um, in a feasible way, though, is when you're simply going from R5 to R2.5. The, the difference just isn't enough to, to justify that. Um, it, what would happen is nobody would do anything. So I think that we're reserving that concept for where there's a bigger lift between so, um, one or the other. Andre, you had a question. Are you good? Okay. Okay. So let me take us to our first uh, discussion question, and this is a this is the broadest of the questions. Um, so as you know, we did present to you, and I'm happy to reiterate the kind of evaluation criteria that we used for the zoning review areas where we're looking at areas that had the 1980 comp plan designation of R2.5 and R5 today. And um, just to quickly uh, recap, we, um, we looked at primarily locational factors like proximity to centers, um, but we also looked at things like um, the lack of infrastructure versus the presence of, of infrastructure investment. We looked at transportation capacity. We looked at the built environment to see what's been built over the last several years. And we, we had a, a long list of things that we evaluated as we looked at each of the zoning review areas. Through testimony, people have raised additional factors that staff did not apply um, in our evaluation. So the question to you for a little bit of discussion right now are any of these factors increased potential for demolition, the effect of redevelopment on neighborhood character and scale, um, pressures of redevelopment on parking and local traffic, uh, effect on, on property values or taxes, or this last question, which relates a little bit to what Gary was talking about, is that um, it was raised in testimony that the potential there's a potential for an impact of a zone change to to affect the racial composition in a transitioning neighborhood. Are any of these factors that you would want us to to apply in a way that might change some of the proposals that are on the table right now? So I just wanted to open that up to you. Um, I, I would like to see C, but more in the context of what Gary's talking about and, and what Maggie is talking about in terms of, um, you know, um, do we have some data to support that the zone change will cause 
or does does cause a change? And if if it does cause a change, then does it cause a will it cause a change in areas that have or working class neighborhoods, and and potentially either help them or hurt them, or in neighborhoods that have racial diversity and and, and diminish the racial diversity, especially in areas that are um, either home ownership um, that are working class neighborhoods or high rental um, neighborhoods. I do have, I'm, I'm reading something that um, I was uh, given just before the meeting to help respond to that question a little bit. Um, and this has to do with the Piedmont neighborhood where this, the E, the uh, piece of testimony was raised by somebody in Piedmont where this was a factor. Um, and, and Leslie said that the Housing Bureau's North Northeast housing strategy will be investing money into affordable apartments, but also home ownership opportunities. And Piedmont was the only um, zoning review area that had been predominantly black historically and is undergoing some changes. Um, so we could talk to the Housing Bureau because this is a, it falls within the North Northeast strategy area and there it will be some support for housing stabilization and home ownership. So there could be some effect there that we could help um, mitigate any effect that the zoning change might have. But so is it the North Northeast strategy? strategy Wasn't it only yeah. $20 million? Yeah. Um, I think that there's, um, th th well, Nan, do you want to? I think it's been. I think the original twenty million has been supplemented um, with additional investment. The um, I guess the the other part of that is, I know the Housing Bureau is looking at around not only in Northeast, but they're looking around um, uh, Powell Division about a home ownership retention strategy um, in different areas of the city. It seems to me we we would want to um, be consistent with their home ownership and retention strategy as a bureau in at least not <laughs> hurting their efforts and trying to encourage their efforts. So mm -hmm. I would want to make sure that our zoning is not hurting, at least hurting their, their okay. efforts and we're in those same areas. And I'm, I know it's north and northeast, but I know they're also looking at the Powell Division strategy um, with the BRT and some other areas out in Lentz, um too. So, okay, uh, uh, an alignment of strategies, mm -hmm. I guess. We'll look at we'll look at that. I mean, a little might need a little catch up. So, these are the things you've been lobbied to include as factors. These, right. Where's these, the list I could read of what you did use as the factors? Oh, okay. Um, I was just looking in my packet. To, oh, okay. In the April twenty first memo. There is a um, list on page five. Five is that? Oh, proximity centers. Okay, I got right. it. Right, and of that and page. that's okay. And and there's a bit more information in the original report, but this is kind of a recap of what what we did look at. And our evaluate our evaluation was taking all these factors kind of on balance. So. Mm -hmm. We looked at them. Um, there was no one factor that would trump the others, but it was looking at the sort of the equal weight. And then in some cases, something was a little bit stronger. In some cases, something else was a little stronger. So it was um, really a balancing of these factors. Um, I will also say that slope hadn't originally been the, one of the factors that we had considered. And that came out of a. Um, uh, community conversation we had in, in the Mount Tabor area where they suggested that ought to be considered. So we added that to our evaluation and as a result of re-looking at the areas that did um, affect our recommendation in a couple places because we hadn't taken that into account originally but then once we did it affected our recommendation. You know I'm I guess I'm I'm a little shocked that E was not considered a factor prior. Um, Particularly, I mean, when we're looking at affirmatively furthering fair housing, when we're talking about equity citywide, I'm, 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 I'm shocked that E was not in your original list of considerations. Um, you have displacement, but it looks uh, race neutral. Um, 
so I'm I'm just I'm just a little affronted by that. Oh, it's something we will now look at. Um, um, well, I just forgot what I was going to say. We looked at, we did look at demographics generally, and I think that the one area where this was, uh, this question came up was in Piedmont. Um, I think that when we looked across the board at the other zoning review areas, they were primarily white ownership, home ownership areas. Um, Piedmont is where, um, actually Leslie, who's not here tonight, raised this issue in her evaluation and it was a concern. Um, so we, we looked at it to the degree that Piedmont kind of jumped out as a place where there was a, a historically black neighborhood there. Um, so I would say it was considered, we're putting it up here and I think now we're following up on that. But I think that in the evaluation that was the one area that, where this was a factor. Jerry? Um, you know, I think a number of these criteria could be potentially important, but what I'm continuing to struggle with is um, not, not having a quantitative framework for knowing how big the decision is relative to the goal. So we need to accommodate X number of new households by 2035. Mm -hmm. And 80% is in centers and corridors, right, and 20% in displaced residential areas. Um, I think it's, um, I want to say it's 50, 30, 20. It's 50 percent in centers and corridors, 30 percent downtown central city, and 20 percent in 20 the traditional in... single family zones. And so these, these are a fraction these are of the in 20 percent then. Well, they are both well, these centers are... and corridors primarily, um, but also they're, they're a mix of centers and corridors and well, single family. Yeah, the, the, the actual, the residential, the um, zoning review areas are all in the 20%. So they, they're just outside of the centers and corners. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but for context, what would be really helpful for me to know, and this is kind of a question six mm -hmm. implication, quantitatively, how big are the ZRAs in that 20%? Are they 10 of the 20%? Are they three of the 20%? Are they one of the 20%? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so to really know that, because these other factors are also, you know, qualitatively p potentially very important, but the size of the trade-off also really matters mm -hmm. in each of the decisions. So, I, it's, yeah, so it's really hard for me to comment on, on these without knowing the magnitude. Well, and this relates some, to something that Eli mentioned last time about how this is a piece of a larger puzzle because as we look at middle housing, generally, and we look at additional areas where we might want to consider, we were zeroing in on the places where there was already a comprehensive plan designation in place. This was not an examination of every opportunity citywide mm -hmm. for this kind of housing. And so I think what this response in number six was trying to say is numerically, if you just look at numbers, we have enough room for all the housing units. But are they the right types of housing Within units? Within the 20%. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so we, we, you know, the more of this type of housing we can produce, the more closely we're aligning with where the need is for this, you know, income level, this, this um, housing preference type, this, uh, you know, entry level kind of housing, so forth. So, you know, uh, uh, the more the better, but there isn't a, a mm -hmm. within that 20%, it hasn't been broken down to the point where we could say we need exactly this many units in this in these zoning review areas because this is just one part of our larger housing yeah. stock. No, I, I, I hear you and I understand, mm -hmm. and the numbers are still important okay. to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, Gary, I guess I, to clarify, um, one of the things we did, as you will remember, several months ago as we did scenario reports and we, we showed you, well, what if we put all of the growth in the central city? What if we did this? How does it meet our different goals? And we came up with a um, prescribed um, recommended scenario for how we would split where it goes. So when we're done doing this and when we look at the proposals for additional middle housing, we'll continue to refine that and say, okay, now that we potentially are shifting some of more of the housing into the 20%, more of the units, 
and now that may, maybe the, the single the traditional single family neighborhoods might end up with 25% of the growth or something like that. But so we'll look at that and look at what it does to all of the things that you go back to the Portland plan and say, okay, if we do that, what does it do to walkability? What does it do to carbon? What does it do to incomes? You know, the things that we care about. Um, to do that incrementally with each one of these, I, I, I think it's a very, very small shift with this change. I think when we come through with um, larger proposals around middle housing, potentially, mm -hmm. we should very clearly define what's the impact in terms of where that housing's gonna go. That helps. Just, um, I, I would just echo uh, what Susan said. Um, from my standpoint, I don't know how much this moves the needle in the single family housing unit, but I am concerned about um, kind of the Portland plan mat um, um, measurements and when you get to middle housing and that change, what it does around demographics and a lot of other things. And so um, I know this is a small change, but I'd like to see the accumulation of that data because the base zone report that council said, we don't need to make any changes ultimately to get to where we, to accommodate everybody. So I understand the rationale why we may want to make a change, but I also want to understand kind of that impact in a cumulative standpoint. And I think Gary's right. The numbers are going to be very important because if we're moving 5% into this zone and we have impacts in some other areas that we what that we're measuring and saying are important to us, it's gonna be important to understand if that's a trade-off we have to make. Teresa, then Eli. <laughs> so D, I think D is interesting in a kind of a higher level discussion as opposed to a specific place by place, you know, totally crazy detail thing. But um, <clears throat> just, yeah, I think you alluded to it a little bit when you were talking before that changing from an R5 to R2.5 might not necessarily do what people think it's going to do in terms of property value. So I, I think sort of a general discussion that maybe just talks a little bit about the economics of, of zone change, if you will. And so th I, I'm, I'm assuming that all of these suggestions for a further inquiry inquiry would be things we'd be bring, bringing back as part of the composite zoning map discussion so that we're informing those, those changes. Okay, um, I think that would be useful to have that, that examination. Eli? Okay, so one possible task and then one impossible one. Um, the possible <laughs> one is to think, sorry, yeah, the possible one is to not have on the list any tool that would, that really is there to prevent development or redevelopment in certain parts of the city. Like that that's not a reason for zoning. Um, so if there's a sense that the advocacy for some change is really just to keep things as, as it is, that, that I, I, I'm hoping that that's sort of like a, a not on the list. It's not on the list right now, which I, I like, but, um, um, but it's, um, I've heard in East Moreland, if they lose the vote, they're talking about like becoming a historic preservation district or something like that. I mean, that's, I, I would like not to see zoning used as a tool for that, for that purpose. So. Um, that's that's the, the possible thing. And then the impossible one is, I mean, demographics. Like, we've got a heck of a lot of one and two person households, a heck of a lot of the city zoned for perfectly big three, four bedroom homes. So there's already a mismatch there. Mm -hmm. um, and the part of the reason it's an impossible thing is we don't know what the rules are gonna be for the single family zoning code yet. I mean, it might be that in that box you could do little units, right? So it's hard to count, but, um, but generally speaking, we've a lot of the city zoned for really large households that don't exist. Um, and so that, that I think would be nice to have as a criteria either for this review you're doing here and or for what you can do in the residential zoning project. Deborah, I'd have to say my take on kind of A, B, C, and, and D are um, they're all falling within kind of discussions we had about comp plan, what, where we need to go. Um, it, change is tough, um, but 
Um, you know, and, and kind of echoing Eli's point is we still have a very large portion of the city that is kind of preserving kind of our traditional single family home neighborhoods. And yes, some areas are going to have to evolve and change. And um, so I guess to me, those are not criteria because they are um, kind of in that boat. There's there's the other items that you looked at. I do I do support, you know, taking a deeper look at making at displacement and understanding if we're, we're making gentrification worse and, and if there's something we can do to be a little bit smarter about that. Any other comments, questions on that one? Great, thank you. So I'm gonna just take all of this as a way for us to go back and sort of relook at the proposals through these screens to see is there anything we, based on this general direction, is there anything we would want to alter as part of our proposal with this in mind? And then we would bring that information back to you to say why we did or didn't make certain changes. So thank you. Okay, are we ready to move to the next question? <laughs> and Chris is gonna take this one on. Okay, so pretty simple question. Um, does the PSC generally support the proposed zoning map changes in the David Douglas School District, which is a temporary reduction of the development potential. So it's kind of opposite of what we've been talking about. And the next slide shows you the map again. Um, just to remind you, I'm show this is showing you what the zoning map will look like. So there's properties that are going from R1 to R2, and some pro most of the properties are going from R2 to R5. So on the zoning map, this is what they look like. This is the comp plan designation, this is the zone. And um, coupling with this mapping exercise, we are also doing some zoning code amendments that will give David Douglas School District the ability to be, a, be identified as a service provider. And so they would get applications for both zone map amendments and land divisions and have the power to say no if the capacity within the school district of the proposed change can't handle the new development that's coming in. Um, that's all the details I have right now. We're still working on that change, but you will be, it will be coming before you. Um, so that's, this is a two-part package. There are about 76 properties on the map, and they're all outlined in red, so you can kind of see them along Powell Boulevard. There's a couple along Division. Um, along, uh, I don't know what that street is. And then um, Star we have Stark, Burnside, and Gleason. Um, so there's about 13 properties that are actually coming off the map because I've heard from a few property owners, the properties are already developed and they were misidentified as having capacity. So there's actually about 63 properties that we're talking about, it's not a lot. Um, let's see. Can I give Chris, you could you could you mention out of the sixty-three properties about how many units we're guessing that is households? Um, I'm trying to remember what we calculated. I think it's less than two hundred at the current zoning, so it's not a lot. And with the reduction in density, it's going to drop a little bit more. But note that the R one to R two still gives you some multifamily capabilities. The other thing to note is that um, we're not really touching any of the properties in the gateway area, which is this um, very colorful part of the map. And a lot of the zoning there is uh, mixed use, a high density mixed use or high density residential. And there's um, tons of capacity in gateway that we're not touching. So really, um, the properties that are, are included on the map aren't going to have a huge impact on David Douglas. What might have more of an impact are the land divisions. And we haven't done the analysis to determine how many lots could be subdivided, but there's quite a few. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't see any testimony about David Douglas. I know last year we had a lot of testimony in support of down zoning. Right. Um, have you heard any negative? Thanks any for reminding me, recently? yes. So there was a fellow who testified at the hearing two weeks ago. He owns two properties on Burnside, and then right down the street from him is another. So we've heard from two property owners, three parcels. And that would be another thing to consider is um, when we finish getting testimony, our, in the past our practice has been to um, 
give the testifiers what they want, and then just leave everybody else as is on the map. So do we want to do that with this project or keep everybody on the map and have another go at city council? So there's a couple of decisions to be made with that as well. And they were, in, to be clear, they were in opposition. Yes, to the they were in opposition. Okay. Yes. Oh yeah, and the, um, Deborah just asked me to tell you that I looked at the um, distance to the transit station area for these two properties and they're outside the quarter mile walking distance to the transit stop, which would give us some you know, general guidance on whether or not to keep them on the map or take them off. So you characterize this as a temporary down zoning. Right. I'm kind of interested in what the, the duration of temporary is likely to be. I mean, unless David Douglas gets a huge bond issue or something, I'm not sure when they're going to feel comfortable taking on you know, more of this capacity. So, Well, it's temporary in the context of the comprehensive plan changes. Mm -hmm. I didn't include that map here, but you might recall um, a larger map that shows a lot of the down designations that are happening mm -hmm. in East Portland and specifically in the David Douglas School District. So those aren't temporary. They're okay. permanent until we get back to the comp plan in another 25 years. Mm -hmm. So we've actually reduced capacity on quite a few other properties. And those include changes from R2 to R5, R2 to R2.5, R5 to R7, and then mm -hmm. we have the hazard down designations, which are going from R10 to R20. So help me understand what makes these more temporary than the comp plan designation? Well, temporary than that the city or the property owner can change back to the higher density. The property owner can make the request, and that's where David Douglas School District would uh -huh. have a veto power if they don't have the capacity. Or the city could do a legislative project similar to this one where we go in en masse and change the properties back to their comp plan designation. So temporary in the sense that there's a change possible but it's yeah. temporal. It's so if we yeah. so for the folks who testified, if we don't honor their requests, um, they'd be in the position of having to go to David Douglas and say, you know, may I? And presumably, go. Th there's a fee associated with that application process, right? Mm -hmm. I do want to add that um, in all of our conversations with David Douglas School District, and we're having another one tomorrow morning. As a matter of fact, there's sort of a an agreement or a deal that. They're actively and aggressively pursuing a bond measure and a facilities plan, and you know, with all due diligence, they're pursuing those um, those opportunities to expand their capacity. So, we um, agreed to make a, propose a zone change, a zoning map change, and a zoning code change, understanding that it was not going to just sit on the books forever, but that this, they were making affirmative progress, and we're going to have an intergovernmental agreement that sort of locks in their commitment to moving forward and we may want to re-examine if, if nothing's happening, if they aren't able successfully to pass a bond measure, if they aren't able to do some of the things they're pursuing, do we want to reconsider? We're going we're gonna to have that be kind of a, a, a firm commitment for both of us. We're each putting something for, forward to help each other to move past this challenge. So similarly, if if they did succeed in a bond measure or some other capacity increase, is, is there some trigger built in that we would revisit these zoning choices right here? I think we could put that into the intergovernmental agreement. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank um, you. And, and the difference, again, between these down zone proposals and the down designation is where we proposed the down designation in the Powellhurst Gilbert neighborhood. That was based on a whole combination of factors with lack of connectivity, lack of services, lack of parks, and lack of school capacity. But school capacity was one of many. In these locations, we don't have that whole array of challenges. It's just the school capacity. And that's why we wanted to make sure we kept the higher um, density designation in place to signal that's where we think we should be at some point, if not immediately. And the only um, thing standing in the way is the school capacity, but everything else is in place. Well, I'm very glad to hear that intergovernment agreement is in the works because I get a little anxious about ceding zoning authority to a school district. Um, and it sounds like they're doing 
some good initiatives there, but as people probably know in other communities, school district capacities uses an excuse for all sorts of stuff that, um, you know, saying you can't build anything else in a, in a community because the schools are filled up, right? Um, so I guess I, I like the idea that that's happening. I don't even know if it would make sense for us to, I'd like to see it at some point, whether mm -hmm. it's through this body or some other. Um, but if, if we're going to be basically giving veto power to a school district over zoning designations where we've already decided as a city we prioritize, you know, focusing development in certain areas, then I'd like to dig into the weeds a little bit on that. Absolutely. We, if we fully intend to bring that agreement to you. Mm -hmm. I'm well, oh, Gary. Um, <clears throat> I think the policy makes sense in terms of taking some pressure off the school district, but I wonder if there are. Have we thought about unintended consequences of this? And I guess kind of my my mental model of this situation is that the David Douglas community um, at one time was more of a self-sustaining working class, middle class community that has um, seen an economic degradation and, there, and therefore cannot pony up more and more for schools in response to a growing population. And I'm, I'm just wondering if there's, if we make this change, is it big enough or, is it big enough or important enough to um, set in motion some unintended consequences like a further further down spiral. Mm. I mean, I, you know, we're, we're trying we're trying to protect them from overpopulation of the school district, but is there is there something bad that could happen? I think part of that was the question about how many units does this really affect, given over the potential growth for the area over the next 20 years. And so we want to look at that and just do a comparison because um, I think our hearts were in the right place in making this this action, and I think it will have some impact. But I, I truthfully don't think that we have done this down zoning in a way that is going to um, it's releasing the pressure, but it's not going to um, make it so that they don't need to build another school. It's it's just oh, kind right. of giving them a little extra time. I think. A little bit, but yeah. I do think pulling the numbers together will be real easy yeah. to do, and we can do that. Um, that one. And it just doesn't begin to address their their real problem. I mean, the, the numbers, they're so far beyond their current capacity, and there's a lot of by right development. Because so I want to remind you that this is only um, looking at reducing um, the ability to do a zoning map amendment or a land division. But if something is already um, allowed by right that isn't affected by a zoning map change or land division, somebody could still build an apartment building and that will still have an impact on the school district. So this isn't a full building moratorium or something that's just freezing things in place. It's sort of a tempering, but not a, a freezing. And how The district undoubtedly. would like us to go much farther than what we're doing is, is, is this the truth. I think it's a little futile. I mean, households displaced from closer neighborhoods will double up you know, out there in David Douglas. So even if you didn't do any changes to the housing, I'll bet you get more people in the system. Yeah, I was just gonna comment that my impression is David Douglas has been a very successful school district in terms mm -hmm. of serving its population. Mm -hmm. They have great outcomes. And so I like to see this partnership trying to help them and be responsive to the fact so that they can continue to serve this population, mm -hmm. give them the advantages that we've called out in the Portland plan, recognizing that, okay, you're gonna need to find the money and you know we're gonna try and help you tread water till you get there. Mm -hmm. But I think trying to, well, we may not be able to do a lot to help with the overcrowding. Trying to do something I think is yeah. appropriate and responsive to there is an, expressed. Thank you. Um, I was gonna add, there is another thing that we're, we're working with them on right now is we've brought in the Parks Bureau and PDC to look at the idea of co-location and um, you know, efficiently planning for site acquisition or even land swaps. So, so we're trying to get creative and be almost like a broker with with the school district and their real estate folks and parks and PDC to see is there something we can do to help engineer a, an agreement that is mutually beneficial and gets them more land and, and a new site. Um, so, this stems from my lack of understanding about how property taxes fund schools in the state, but. Um, do local property taxes fund local schools, or does that go to the 
state and it's distributed fairly evenly across the state? Primarily the latter. There is a, there's some formula that's complicated, but it goes to the state and comes back to local governments. Um, where they have a disadvantage as a school district um, compared with other districts is that their assessed valuation in order to get a bond measure passed is is not that high so that they have a limit to what kind of bond measure they can actually pass and that's that's been a deterrent and and there's also they've had trouble in recent years even having something pass even at a lower level um, the population hasn't voted for it so um, I think that you know they're really hoping this time around that they can they can pass a bond measure but but again, um, we, uh, one of the reasons, well, this gets into a whole other, it's complicated, but we, we were talking with PDC about any extension of an urban renewal district, for example, would have an impact on the bonding capacity for the school district. So that's where we brought in PDC to talk about, well, let's make sure we don't do anything through extension of a URA that might um, uh, tamp down the ability of the district to support a bond measure. So it's all very interconnected. and. This is a, a, a complicated puzzle. Okay. So, so thinking about unintended consequences, but otherwise sort of generally supportive of this, and we'll, we'll come in with numbers and, and a, another look at any unintended consequences, but advance these zoning map changes for the next iteration of the map with more discussion ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to our next question and I'm gonna invite up Nan Stark for this one. And this is an area specific, so you're gonna to start to see some more maps. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm gonna talk about two neighborhoods in Rose City Park, which is just north of I-84. Um, in the 50s and 60s, and a little bit in the 40s. Uh, so the first one is in the Max, 60th Ave Max Station area. Um, and the question is, does the, do you support retaining the R5 zoning and general pattern um, that reflects R5 development in this area? Or should the zoning be changed to reflect its location? as the 60th Ave station area, which um, uh, had, had the uh, designation added to it back in 1980, which was around the time that the max, that the blue line was established and that station area was created um, with R2 and R1 and RH um, designations on it. <coughs> This is what City Council is looking at right now in terms of the comp plan map. So um, what you have is this map, and I just want to flip back and forth with those two. Um, this is the, uh, the original pattern of zoning. So you can see the, the existing zoning and comp plan designations on there. The southern area has RH designation, the middle has R1, and the northern um, along Halsey has R2 designation. And um, Rose City Park got together and decided that they wanted to re-align, um, re reshape that pattern, uh, partly because they are feeling that RH zoning doesn't belong in this area at all and should be eliminated and that there shouldn't be high density housing uh, in close proximity to the freeway. Um, and, and they also just wanted to align it um, parallel to 60th Ave, where, which leads to the light rail station and is the main corridor there, and then um, bring the density down um, going east and west of it. So this is their um, proposal to city council, which shows 60th Ave actually being designated mixed use, which is a big um, change from the current RH, R1, and R2. Um, and then the darker blue alongside the red 
is the R1 designation, and then on both sides of that is R2 designation. So um, this is what city council is looking at right now. We don't know where they're landing um, on this. What we do know is that we originally proposed this um, iteration, and we have, and, and Deborah talked to, to you about this, right, a couple weeks ago, or some point recently, that we were changing our map to reflect Rose City Park's idea. Um, and so uh, what we're proposing in the zoning is going to be a map that looks more like this. However, we um, did not make the change to mixed use. So that's, that's kind of a value capture area there along 60th where we would um, agree with mixed use zoning along 60th. We would shorten it to um, two blocks south of Halsey and then um, uh, propose the zoning to be R1 along 60th and the um, streets adjacent to it and then the R2 adjacent to the park and um, on the easternmost side. Does everybody more or less follow that? I think one way to look at it is that it was it was an opportunity for a lot of growth and a lot of it didn't happen. And part of it was it was very dispersed because there was a lot of area. So there were little things popping up but not all at once. The idea to have a commercial zone and then have it kind of fall away from there was something we really liked. But we also thought that the pink there, mixed use and commercial, would be it would be too much. That there's not enough demand to really build all of that out. And so um, what Nan was just saying was that the pink there would actually be cut in about half, maybe just, and that would be R1. Would, yeah. would just would stay R1. And so by concentrating it, you have actually a potential for a node there of a commercial node that people could walk to and it's all in one place instead of more of a interrupted strip development. This would, this would give us a new opportunity. So that's one of the amendments that city council is looking at. And I know this is hard because we're doing this at the same time, but as part of the comp plan, they're looking at that as um, one of the amendments to shorten that up. So a question, would, the, <clears throat> would it be as proposed R, RH, with the, but the existing zone would still be R5, so someone would have to go through a type three process to get it up to RH, or would you actually bring the zoning up to the higher level? Yeah, so um, you can see that this entire map uh, in the crosshatched area is all currently zoned R5. So that's really the question before you is, um, do you wanna keep it R5 in response to what we've heard from the community, which is they wanna keep it at R5, um, or do you want to do the up zone to match the comp plan or some other and specifically, the testimony was to keep R5 everywhere except where there are already are buildings that exist that are um, of a higher density. So they were proposing, right, to, um, and I think isn't your next slide yeah. show? Yeah, so, so uh, um, one of the things that came up at your public hearing, I think I had talked about, based on a recent conversation I had had with the, um, that both of us had had with the neighborhood um, leadership, we thought that there was some agreement about bringing the zoning into conformance with the comp plan, um, but then subsequently they had taken a vote and said, no, 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 we actually want to keep it all as R5. So that's the new testimony that's before you, is, is not to go ahead and make the zone change. Go ahead with the comp plan designations, but not the zone change. Would you, okay. would you say that that's perhaps the reason why there's not been redevelopment, because you have to go through the zone change process? I mean, is, is, I don't know how much of an obstacle it is. There's, we've heard that, to, to a large degree, the market just isn't here yet for that kind, level of, of, of intensity of, of residential use. So it's been kind of a slow um, progression. But for the most part, it is primarily single-family homes on 5,000 square foot lots at this point. So if yeah, you just can see actually, sorry, on that map that um, there's been six areas where the zoning has been changed through a okay, yeah. map amendment. There, there. 
Sorry, Catherine. It's okay. So Deborah, is this a case of maybe a divided neighborhood? Um, I guess I'm not following the, it sounds the like they're, they're very excited about getting the comp plan changed, but then don't want change. So I, that's where I'm a little confused. I'm trying to get my why head. Don't, why don't I go through um, some of the testimony for you and see if we can, I mean, I, I would say that hearing from the na neighborhood, um, yeah, there's, there's some, there's uh, some split, but the majority of the testimony did say we like our single family neighborhood. We don't really want to see it change. That also, was. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> they also point out a lot of the testimony, I think, touches on the lack of transportation infrastructure that they um, think isn't adequate to support the higher density. Um, are you going to touch on that? Yeah. Okay. And we have a handout for you to address it. Go ahead. Was there another question, Maggie? Yeah, I just I can't read it. <laughs> so I was I was curious. So where you put in the um, the commercial right uh -huh. in the middle that that's sixtieth. Yes. Okay. And then Halsey to the north. Okay. Where the commercial is also. Okay. And then the light rail, or, or sorry, I eighty four, um, just to the south. And then the max is on sixtieth is. Well, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Chris. So, so um, <coughs> just to put this in context, just south of here is North Tabor, right, which is begging us for more density, right? So you've exactly. got similar infrastructure characteristics and two very different neighborhood responses to the opportunity, <laughs> right? Am I, am I understanding that correctly? You made a good point, Chris. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> But you also have the sandy corridor just above this that has a ton of commercial stuff and not it's not all full. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I also just wanted to show this map, which um, those, those tan squares are um, developments that are not single family. So in the neighborhood there are about 30 properties that are developed with other than single family homes. Um, about 20 of those are duplexes, and the rest are anywhere from triplexes to 12 plex. There's a 10 plex and a 12 plex, um, the majority being triplexes. So it does have some mix. That represents about 20% of the area. There's about um, 200 properties in this zoning review area, so of that, about 30 are developed differently than R5. And some of those are on lots that are not zoned R5 also. Um, some of the testimony was about the lack of improved streets. So there definitely is an issue um, internally. The bottom slide is showing 60th Ave, which is almost entirely from Halsey to um, the light rail station developed with single family houses that are built pretty close to the, to the street. Um, so there's not a big front setback there and the sidewalks are literally about three and a half feet wide. So you're dealing with um, you know, some, some kind of big transportation constraints as well. Okay, we'll stay on that. Um, very briefly, I just want to go over the other. So, so the number one uh, testimony was we want to preserve our existing character and the scale of the neighborhood. Um, number two was, um, and the rest of these aren't in order of magnitude of testimony because they were all pretty equal, but definitely everybody did talk about preserving this, the single family character and scale of the area. Um, the, uh, the Neighborhood Association in particular talked about health concerns of high density housing being located near the freeway and that they didn't want to see that happen. Um, another big one is inadequate infrastructure with the unimproved streets, um, not a good bike network here, the narrow sidewalks. Um, the fourth one was that this is a this is a stable area 
of affordable owner-occupied houses, um, some apartments, and that a change could have an effect on affordability and also cause some displacement if it were to become um, you know, more of a place. And then finally, um, a few people raised the fact that this is kind of operating as an unofficial park and ride area and that parking would you know, be more exacerbated um, with higher density. Um, so again, to reiterate what Deborah said, the um, Neighborhood Association did vote that they wanted to retain the R5 zoning with the exception of um, areas or, or properties that are um, developed other than single family housing. Um, so that map that I showed you um, would, you know, if, if you were to adopt something like what they're suggesting, you'd have a pretty spotty map, but, um, you know, not that that needs to be a decision factor. Um, so in terms of our perspective, um, in terms of, yeah, we, we foresee the resulting changes would be slow and incremental. Um, as I said, there's already quite a few duplexes in the area. Uh, our, there's, this is mostly uh, a pattern of 5,000 square foot lots, so R2 would result primarily in duplexes, attached house situations. Um, you wouldn't be able to get more density than one additional unit. R1 would be a bit of a game changer. You could get up to five units on a 5,000 square foot lot, so you could see some actual redevelopment of of the houses there. Um, but it's also an opportunity, you know, when we're talking about middle housing to create some options and some opportunities for alternatives that we're looking at through the residential infill project. So um, we do have, you know, a lot of those things to consider in terms of um, can we still preserve a neighborhood that people love and, and can afford to stay in that's close in and, you know, is rich in services and also um, just incrementally make some not huge changes. So I think that's, you know, part of the question that I want you to consider um, when you're looking at it. And again, um, just to reiterate that we, um, we put the comp plan designation on a portion of 60th Ave for mixed use, but we didn't, but we kept the residential zoning there. Um, and then finally, um, there's the whole PBOT issue, and Deborah um, gave you, uh, yeah, this table and map. Um, there are two projects on here uh, that PBOT has put on their constrained list, and um, so it's the second one down and the second one from the bottom um, about uh, pedestrian and bicycle improvements in this station area. So um, a big issue for PBOT is being able to um, make the case for that in an area that has higher density. Zoning is easier to do than in an area that's R5. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem um, there that the neighborhood does recognize. So um, going back to the question is, um, do you support retaining the R5 zoning or is this an area where we do want to upzone? Go ahead, Chris. So if we zoomed out a bit on our lens, and particularly thinking about North Tabor, which you know asked us during the complaint and we gave them a neighborhood center designation, um, would we be better off in the near term letting the density go to North Tabor and create the center and not take on Rose City Park, which is you know a, kind of an unwilling partner, until after that center is established, and we need to look to sort of broaden the area of density. Is that is that a rational strategy? Yeah, I think that's a question for everybody here. Okay, well I'll put it out there as a question for my colleagues. <laughs> then. <laughs> Eli and then. Go ahead, Eli. Then Teresa. Okay. Um, 
I guess I don't know the boundary where North North Tabor does it go up to the south side of the interstate? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess that seems like good. If, if in, the, in the other big lens, geographic lens, I mean, this place is a great location. I mean, compared to Gateway, you know, which is all zone, all kinds of R two multiple dwelling zoning. Um, and here we have a lot of RFIs on walking distance to Mac, walking distance to Providence Health Center, good park. Um, it seems like if we let this develop at its own pace, sleepy style, that's fine with me, I, I think. But um, I'd like to leave the capacity for housing there. Um, so um, I guess I'm a little not totally tracking the, the, the comp plan potential changes with council and what we're considering. Um, but I like the idea of having a little commercial node there in R1. Um, Alongside, which actually might actually someone could take advantage of it and get some units, um, some homes built there. Um, but I'm, I'm intrigued by Chris's idea. I mean, I think that if the other, I mean, you don't have to cross the freeway to get to a lot of the stuff if you do it on the south side. So they could grab the, grab the hub, I guess. <laughs> so uh, 53rd is a bike street, so that's only seven blocks away from 60th. Um, I think that because of what's already been developed there, it's a prime area for our middle housing experiment. Um, so I would be in favor of allowing zoning that would do that and not, I mean, not doing anything to make it happen overnight, which it doesn't anyway. And then regarding um, Tabor, why not have both? We certainly need that much housing in our city. Um. Will we get the middle housing discussion around this area when we get the middle housing discussion, I guess? Would this area be in the middle housing discussion? It's likely that um, when we have the middle housing discussion, you're going to look at a couple of different choices. And one of them is, is it going to be just around centers, centers mm -hmm. and corridors? Or is it going to be, you know, everything from 82nd in or, you know, the entire city? Um, and we're going to give you some choices to look at. And there's going to be recommendations from the residential infill project, which looks at where along that continuum, that group, and then staff is going to recommend to you. Uh, so this one's kind of on the border, depending upon which end of the continuum. You know, it's not... It's not, you know, 39th and Belmont. Belmont so yeah. uh, what would you say from you two at, at the discussion there? This is kind of on the edge in terms of, uh, in terms of that group of, of, of acceptance of. I, I'm, I'm guessing that there might be two flavors of middle housing. One is like the R5 zone flavor that looks and feels like single family house neighborhood. Maybe not a house as big. And so this area is currently zoned for that flavor, right? But the, the other flavor is more like the R1 flavor. We actually have courtyard developments and things like that um, that are at a higher density. So that's what the comp plan is showing for this area. So I guess it, I guess it could go either way, I mean, um, in, in my mind. Um, so that's not a very good answer, but that's the best I can no, think of it. I was asking because if, it, if it's an area really in that thought process, I'd rather pick it up under that thought process um, and kind of think through it there as is this an appropriate place for middle housing close to a transit station between really Sandy Boulevard when you look at what's happening along Sandy and uh, Tabor, what we've designated there versus kind of the isolated discussion we're having about just 60th Street. No, it's a really good point. I, yeah. Deborah, does this go along with your kind of opening statement about there might be some issues that are better to move forward and continue to kind of push? Is this one of those where to continue to look at taking it to R1 and, and giving you that direction, at least gives the opportunity to continue to vet it, to continue to study it, to continue to have this conversation and understand a little better, a little bit more time for input from other people to kind of help us weigh in on the final decision when we go to do the map change. Yeah, I, I mean, 
Yeah, just to repeat, I think it's easier to keep something on the map and keep the conversation going than to pull it off and then say, okay, upon further examination, we want to put it back. So with that in mind, probably keeping it on, but opening up the conversation with some of these additional ideas in mind, like, you know, what is the residential infill project? Look, what might that look like here? And, you know, is there some fine tuning that maybe also works? There, there's some there's some threads we could follow, mm -hmm. but in the meantime, keep it on the map, so. Yes, go ahead, Maggie. Um, yeah, I mean, it does seem like a great location for more density, but I guess I'd, I'd also go back to number one and the potential for the zone change on displacement, and if, you know, the testimony was accurate about uh, susceptibility for those owners or tenants to be displaced. Um, of course, the demographics in the neighborhood and what, what that looks like. Um, so understanding that more would help me make a, a, a more informed decision. I, I think I would say one thing is that right now you have a 10 plex in an R5 zone, so that's totally non-conforming. In an extreme situation, it could be torn down and replaced with a house. Um, so that's the opposite end of this place, you know, what could happen if we didn't change. Um, right. I don't think that's likely to happen. Well, because they're, they're asking for less density, right, o outside of that right. little corridor. So well, I'm curious if. They're asking to just keep the status quo. Oh, okay, okay. And then the city's proposal was to turn it to R1, is that correct? Well, their their comp plan proposal is, is for, like you were saying, R2 along the edges and R1 in the middle and along 60th. Teresa. Absolutely. So just to follow up on the what the residential infill committee is doing, so people are generally saying middle housing or alternative housing, good idea, but not in my neighborhood. And so that's really what we're going to have to work on is good idea, but we do actually have to designate some places where it can go. And, you know, to credit the neighborhood, um, several people said I'm not against density. I like the idea of the mixed use possibility coming into our neighborhood and you know in the future getting getting some buildings like that um, I yeah we had invited PBOT staff to be here tonight and they had a conflicting meeting um, I think that um, I, I do want to call your attention in the April 21st memo, there is a response to the question you had asked about the way in which PBOT considers um, infrastructure deficiencies, transportation infrastructure deficiencies, um, as they advise us about zone map changes. And so I do, it's not the only issue the neighborhood brought up, but it is an issue where I think what PBOT says and what the neighborhood's concerned about don't match because I think here PBOT is asserting that the best way to get the improvements people are asking for is to offer opportunities for redevelopment. And so it's that chicken and egg question. And I think that if we decide to leave the area at R5 for now, um, things will not change. There is no sort of vehicle to, to improve some of the um, substandard streets and sidewalks. So it would be one of the things that I think we would need to be really clear with, with neighbors that that's, that's the trade-off that they may be looking at is retaining the status quo but not seeing some of the sidewalks complete. So I'm going to go out on a limb to move this along a little bit and just I think I'm hearing general consensus to continue to study it, to continue to look at it, it being an R2 or an R1 uh, versus retaining the R5, if I'm stating that correctly. And um, certainly this is a recommendation to continue looking at it. We'll look at it when it comes back around. Is, that, is everyone nodding okay? Sounds good. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, oh yeah, we still, oh, we're only on the second one. Yeah. Uh -oh. There's a reason I was. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we're gonna go a little bit west um, to the Euclid Heights subdivision 
where um, so so we're looking at the rectangle right in the middle of this um, that is zoned R5 R2.5 <clears throat> and um, again this this has been there um, ha has been in this zoning and comp plan configuration since 1980 um, 47th Ave is to is bordering on the west and Halsey is bordering to the north and then um, I-84 is just to the south. Um, this is 100% uh, single family built um, uh, neighborhood. Uh, it is, it's got the, the two streets that are curvilinear and there is a slope happening um, along Wasco. So that is a bit of a constraint that we did take into consideration. Um, we still recommended changing the zoning to R2.5, primarily because it's, it, it is in a service-rich area. Again, it's um, uh, just across 47th to the west. You can see R1 and CXD um, zoning. So that is the edge of the, the Hollywood plan district. And then the Hollywood... Um, um, 42nd Ave Transit Center is about a half a mile away. Um, you've also got Providence Office Park is in that CXD zone right across the street, and um, and then the Providence campus is just to the south. So you've got uh, big employment uh, really close by. So that's really where we were coming from in terms of, yes, this um, could benefit from getting the higher zoning to match the designation. Um, again, I don't know where city council is gonna land on this. The neighborhood took a very strong stand here saying um, there's never been a single property owner requesting to change to R2.5. So why should we change this single family neighborhood? Why should we you know, um, incent any kind of change here? Um, it's uh, it's built with houses from the 20s, 30s, 40s, into the 50s. Um, so it's a very stable uh, neighborhood, and that's what the testimony really reflects. We're a stable neighborhood. We're, we're single family in character and scale. We don't want to see that changing, um, and that's what the neighborhood... Um, said that they don't see any reason to change that and that um, it's old enough for some preservation to be happening. Oh, right. Gary and, I do Gary have and a few Teresa. photos of the area. Uh, question. Um, the write-up mentions a 20% slope. I'm assuming we're talking about slope, slope, um, hillside. Is is the 20% just, is, that's taken as a symbol of landslide danger? Or is it or is it more kind of a building and planning issue? Right, it's more of a building constraint. Okay. So it's not specifically related to the geology of that slope? No. Okay. Yeah, I would just support the neighborhood's thoughts on the quality, the stock quality of the housing is, is good. It's in that sort of um, age range that's preferred amongst Portlanders, you know, sort of the craftsman -y kind of houses. And so, and it is very single family looking and feeling kind of place. So I guess my reaction looking at it is that this is maybe a more suitable middle housing candidate than Rose City Park um, and kind of place where you'd want to see lots and lots of ADUs. Um, that's maybe more complementary to the existing character. Um, so I'm not sure if the best way to get there is R2.5 or to leave it at R5 and look, wait for middle housing to come in and create some policy that would help this and be interested in the thoughts of the folks around the task force. Well, my my thought tends to be that going R5 to R2.5 doesn't 
take down nice old houses um, very often. It, it's it, it's more likely to take down some really rough houses or get you to slip in another house, another lot. It takes a more of a density bonus to start. Like the houses in the image there, I, I, I don't think the economics would take those homes down with a, a, a 2.5 instead of a 5 zoning. If it went to much higher than that, then maybe it might happen. So my inclination is to, um, it's a great location, not just current residents, but future people should be able to live there. So I tend to go towards the 2.5 and, and the market may not do anything with it, but um, occasionally there might be places where, um, where, where you get an extra home in there. Yeah, and my, my inclination is, is similar. Um, and then thinking about how we voted on Eastmoreland, right? Like, it's got access to transit. Um, it's, a, it's a good location. Um, but we didn't, we didn't want to down designate it, down zone it necessarily. Um, so I would, I would probably be supportive of our 2.5. So one of the things we talked about in the residential infill committee is if it's in an R5 space and it reads like an R5 allowed size building, you can have more units in it. So this would be a great place for that kind of thing with the big older houses and that sort of character. But we actually aren't there yet and I don't know if we will get to that spot, so. Else? And again, right now it's in city council's hands, and and so they're actually looking at well, are we going to keep the R two point five designation, or are we going to down designate, which would be the neighborhood's preference? Is there an amendment active on that? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah. So I guess I would probably oppose that amendment. <laughs> <laughs> well, just just to, to maybe add to the nods, because I think. It, I think we're almost tipping the scales there is I, I would also agree to kind of continue to look at a 2.5 um, and again it's I think it's back to what Teresa is saying I don't think 2.5 means that a house has to come down but um, we can be creative about how to maybe divide houses up like we used to be creative about it so thank you so, okay. so we're going to move on to uh, Southeast Henry Street in Southeast Portland Marty will so good evening. Uh, again, I'm Marty Stockton. I'm the Southeast District Liaison. So I wanted to talk about um, an area specific, um, you know, a portion within kind of the, the zoning review area around the Woodstock Neighborhood Center. Um, within Woodstock, we received about um, 15 to 16 items of testimony, and about 12 of them were specifically focused on Southeast Henry. So I just wanted to talk about that testimony and then also talk about some of the existing conditions as well as conversations and coordinations with the Portland Fire and Rescue Bureau. Um, so the testimony uh, on Southeast Henry was, there was actually multiple components to it. Um, it was focused on the fact that, and it's really hard to see on this map because of the aerial photo, but it's, it's this street right here um, so the components of the testimony were that this is a dead-end street. Um, the dead-end street is approximately 466 feet in, in length. Um, and there was concern about the fact that um, there wasn't, uh, there, or excuse me, there is not a turnaround or a hammerhead. There was uh, one community member that did a really good job in her due diligence, and so she did go and talk to um, uh, Fire Bureau staff down in the Development Services Center as well as other staff um, and uh, got some information from the Fire Bureau and was again concerned about um, the lack of the hammerhead or turnaround on, on that's uh, currently um, not there. Um, other components of the testimony related to concerns about parking that might um, you know, a, an increase in parking that might be attributed to redevelopment or additional units along the street. There was concerns about um, this right here is the apostolic um, church. And um, there is, uh, it's hard to tell actually from this aerial photo, but there are definitely some large trees on site. So there was, you know, concerns related to um, fire, um, you know, uh, um, and, and then again, 
again, relationship to the fact that this is, this is a dead end street. Um, there were some other comments as well, but I think those were the, the ones that really related to kind of um, the questions that we were asking the community as far as what additional criteria we should be looking at. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit more context because we're kind of zooming in and now I want to zoom back out to where this is in relationship to the Woodstock Neighborhood Center. So this is the Woodstock Neighborhood Center um, and specifically it is uh, a boundary around the um, commercial mixed use designation and the multi-dwelling designation. Um, you can see this is actually well within a quarter mile. So um, Southeast Henry is right here. It is um, down, If this is actually 52nd, so you go down 52nd, and the Goodwill facility is, you can't really see it, but it's right there. So it's essentially two blocks to the north of Southeast Henry, and then Woodstock Boulevard itself is about four blocks um, north of Southeast Henry. Um, so that's, that's the location. And this area, again, is, is all within kind of the R2.5 um, comp plan that is surrounds the, the Woodstock Neighborhood Center. And that was a, from 1980 designation. Okay. So I really wanted to look at and understand um, what the existing conditions are with the concerns related to fire, um, specifically with the dead end nature, and then just kind of the fire response times. And so this is a map um, of the fire response times. And you can again see, actually, would you mind? I always get, my hand gets shaky when I'm up here. So Southeast Henry is just north of Southeast Duke. And you can see that that area is a light green color. So when you look down below, you can see that it's not the fastest response time, which is uh, five minutes and 20 seconds or shorter, but it's the sec second best fast time, which is between five minutes and 21 seconds to six minutes. So that is how quickly um, fire response can get to this particular area within Woodstock. Um, additionally, I have a layer on this map. <laughs> <laughs> Do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, no, no. So, so the, the actual dead end um, street that I'm referring to is actually, it's there, yes. So you can see the big property there. That's the Apostolic Church, yeah. Thank you. Much appreciated. Um, additionally, on this map, I did want to understand where the fire hydrants are. And so the red dots are where all the fire hydrants are located, and you can see that there is a fire hydrant right at Southeast Henry in um, 50 seconds. So again, I'm just providing some um, existing conditions because I want to understand kind of what the situation is. So specifically in, relates, uh, in regards to Southeast Henry, um, it is a 55 foot uh, right away. Um, and again, the, the um, east to west is about approximately 466 feet. East, east to west. So here's a picture. Um, so it is a fully improved street. It does have sidewalks, planter strips, curbs, and the, the width of the street is approximately 32 um, feet in width um, from curb to curb. Um, it does allow parking on both sides. And so um, there is parking that's allowed currently on both sides. Okay, so I'm going to stay there for a second. <laughs> so, that's 52nd where the church is, right? So 52nd, it would actually be behind us. So this would be looking, if we were on 52nd, this would be looking east. So we're looking east at the Apostolic Church. That's the rooftop of the church. So if you go back to this map, where that 55 in yellow is, that is where you would be standing for this perspective. <laughs> um, oh, uh, another point I should say is on the north side, um, you see the, the building um, just to the north. That is um, an apartment building, um, and that is zoned R2. So that's um, just something to be aware of. I, I don't know if we have a, a zoning map. 
No, we don't. What's that? Okay, yeah, we'll just leave that alone. Um, so when we get a lot of testimony, um, part of it is not wanting to have an immediate response or immediate reaction. It's, it's really wanting to do our due diligence in, in, you know, number one, just really listening and observing to the feedback, but also doing our own kind of due diligence as well. Um, so the conversations, and just back a bit, I would just say that the Portland Fire and Rescue um, Bureau has been phenomenal. They've been incredibly responsive. Um, when I was working with the fire marshal on this particular um, question, um, he went out and did a site visit. He measured the right away, um, got back to me. We um, exchanged some emails back and forth as far as um, you know, I'm trying to understand your fire code, and I, you know, and so just again, he, he was incredibly helpful. So I just want to state that for the record. Um, so one thing I think that is um, just a point of clarification is that we have public streets all over the city that don't necessarily meet the ideal. And the ideal is a through street where you can drive around the corner. Um, the reasons for the streets that don't necessarily meet the ideal is that we have topography, we have existing development, we have a way that development occurs where um, different lots redevelop at different times. And um, you know, there isn't necessarily the opportunity to have a connection um, all the way through. With that said, um, the, there are multiple ways to address um, fire standards. And so in this situation, the hammerhead and the turnaround is one of a menu of options that are acceptable to the Fire Bureau. So in addition to the hammerhead and the turnaround, alternatives could be having properties sprinklered. So for example, on this map, you can see that there was a land division in 2004. You can see that, you know, the 2004 on the plat. And stepping back a bit, the fire code treats one unit and two units exactly the same. So if it is a single family house, whether it's a duplex, whether it's attached house, it's treated under the same section of the fire code. So in the situation of the 2004 um, land division, that house, the new house, was required to be sprinklered. And so if that house had been a duplex, it would have been required to be sprinklered. So it would have been the same situation. In this situation, um, there's actually a lot of flexibility because Henry has um, quite a bit of width that wouldn't normally be I mean, that's, they're fortunate in that way, in that here we have um, the paved width of 32 feet from curb to curb. The minimum requirement in the, in the fire code is actually 28 feet. So 28 feet still would allow you to have parking on either side and would allow a fire truck to go down. And they could still go down and not hit, hit anyone's side mirrors. So that, again, 28 feet is the minimum we have 32 feet here. Um, some other things that the fire bureau would consider, assuming there's a flat grade, which this is, is that they could consider to um, remove parking on one or both sides if they felt that was a concern. Um, again, there's also the sprinkling option. So there's some flexibility. There's also the ability to do more than one if there was a concern. With that said, the Fire Bureau's standard is that um, they uh, have no problem with a dead end that is 300 linear feet. So in this situation, <laughs> um, essentially, it is the first flag lot would be the, where the 300 feet is. So you would have um, six properties that are well within the 300 feet. Um, so from a fire bureau perspective, um, again, they treat single family and two units the same way. 
And um, again, there's a lot of flexibility with how they could address this um, either on a site by site or for the full street. Um, stepping back a bit, whenever we have questions that come up that are so targeted, as planners, we have to step back a bit and ask ourselves, where would there be other applicable areas that we would need to consider if we are going to get direction that this is a criterion that we should pause on? Um, so again, the staff recommendation around Woodstock is that we are recommending a, a zone change from R5 to R2.5 to support the neighborhood center. Um, you know, the, the initial proposal for Southeast Henry um, did not factor in the, um, the you know, the, the feedback because that was brought to our attention in the testimony. So, um, you know, one way, you know, there's, there's kind of three choices that we have. We can have to, you know, go forward with the, the zone change to R2.5 for the full area. We have a more kind of modest compromise, um, which is supported by the Fire Bureau, which would be to um, change just the area that is within the 300 linear feet and hold off on the properties that are beyond that, um, just because there may be one or multiple of the menu items that they would need to choose from at that point. And again, um, that, would that, that, that would need to occur through either a building permit, um, a land division, or a zone change. So there's multiple ways that the, the Fire Bureau can address fire code. Um, and then additionally, we could um, you know, just honor the testimony of the community members along Southeast Henry. And again, I think every single property owner on Southeast Henry that is with that received notice did testify. Um, and then and, and proposed to keep the status quo. So those are kind of the options before us. With that said, I do feel that we can't treat Southeast Henry in isolation. So I do think that if you are giving us direction on this, that that direction should be um, applied to other areas with similar characteristics in zoning review areas. Um, I have put in a GIS request last week to identify where there are rights of way that dead end that are 300 linear feet, or zero to 300 in 301 in greater. So it's something that we are doing some, some more analysis on for just the zoning review areas. So that was I've, very thorough. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, everything Megan. west of 52nd is 2.5. Mm -hmm. So before the comp plan changes or so with the new comp plan changes? With, with, with the comp plan. So everything around the Woodstock Neighborhood Center currently is zoned R5 but comped R2.5. And that is, a, again, a 36-year designation. So that street's super nice because I'm over there all the time. Those roads anywhere west of 52nd between like, so yeah, so this way are awful. I would be more concerned about a fire truck being able to get over potholes the size of swimming pools than get through there. So I just, <laughs> I think that's a really accessible street compared to every other street in that area. Narrow, no sidewalks, pothole, huge potholes. So it's it's just a very accessible street comparatively. So does that mean you're in favor of? Yes. Okay. Two point five. Perfect. Eli. I guess I I thought that was really compelling public testimony on this one um, compared to some others I've heard, but I think it's good to get your perspective too because. I mean, the trees, the trees are far away from that church site. It's not right there. Fire Bureau, it makes sense. I mean, Fire Bureau, they just come about backing up after they put the fire out. Um, and it was well, well within 600 feet of the line requirement. And as you said, they have triggers. They can require sprinkling if they want, you know. Um, so I'm, and it's an improved street. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm agreeing with my, to, to keep going at 2.5. Gary? I'm sorry, Marty. I'm confused. 
Um, the, is the Bureau saying that in order to switch to 2.5, there would need to be sprinklers? No, so, what's that? Oh. I, I do I deal with the fire department a lot on this stuff. That if you want to get a building permit and you're too far away from a hydrant or too far away that the vehicle can get to, then they can make a condition on your building permit to do certain upgrades, like install a new hydrant or sprinkle your building. So in order to say this were zoned R1 or something, you know, the, something much higher density, then the fire department, um, recognizing that their access is not as good as it is in some areas, can require additional things of the builder to supplement the fire suppression options for the site, um, independent of zoning. So just want to build anything there. So there's a choice of, of installing a hydrant or a sprinkler, a hydrant on the block or sprinklers within the, within the property? So, yeah, usually the developer has to cover that cost. The developer always has to cover the cost as far as I know. Um, and the developer has to provide something above and beyond what the base code is in order to accommodate a situation where it may be hard to get a fire vehicle there. But it's pretty common, if you have a deep lot, a lot of times the, the, the house in the back of the lot have to be sprinkled for exactly the same reason that we're talking about here. So is the issue here absence of a hydrant? No. So again, no, there is a hydrant right on 52nd and Henry. Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry? There's a hydrant currently on 52nd and Henry. It's, the issue is the length of the street is, long, is create some lots that are further away from the hydrant than the fire department would like to see them. Okay, and then the other thing I'd like to point out is that when you showed the response time map, that's actually really good performance in response time when you look at it citywide. There are areas, particularly in the Southwest Hills, mm -hmm. that have way worse response mm -hmm. time than this neighborhood does. And the citywide response time map is at the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. Chris. Well, this is a little bit tangential, but uh, at some point we're going to think about sprinkling all single family to help reduce our fire suppression costs long long term. So um, I don't see any reason not to keep looking at this. I would agree. So I think that's kind of a majority of nods. Um, do you have just something kind of to... Yeah, just the question I had was, I understand the new developer is going to sprinkle that house, but you have other houses that are existing that aren't sprinkled that are at that area, and you're potentially mm -hmm. increasing the parking and the density, the congestion mm -hmm. on that street. So that's my concern. I just wonder, is there a way to you know push for the option of a closer hydrant or something that would benefit the whole area as opposed to just sprinkling that development? So the issue, again, is not the location of the hydrant. The location of the hydrant is actually very good. The issue is that um, the dead end street exceeds the um, 300 linear feet. And so you have 166 feet approximately that go beyond. And for them, um, you know, ideally they, uh, you know, it's, there's no problem getting to a fire and being able to address the fire. It's, um, you know, that, uh, you know, they would have to back out a truck. truck. And, um, you know, I, I would say that, uh, you know, I, I've seen some very skilled drivers in the fire bureau. Um, but that, that is, uh, you know, a, a, you know the, the issue with, with uh, again, the, the situation on Henry and the fire code standards. I would just say, uh, having built streets and dealt with the fire department, it is about equipment size, really. Um, the fire department wants to be able to bring their largest piece of equipment down to a fire, even though this is single family. And you need 28 feet, well, you could get smaller, but you need 20 feet of space to be able to put all the outriggers out and deploy all their equipment. The other issue is just without a hammerhead, they've got to back that out. Mm -hmm. And that's a long ways to back a piece of equipment. Um, that said, you've got 55 feet you could take away um, parking and and reconstruct the street to a wider street and um, get out to almost 40 feet or 45 feet and um, have a pretty wide at the end um, or take a little bit of yard and almost have a circle if you wanted to with the easement at the end. Um, 
so I, 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 I'm supportive of this. Um, I think the fire issue is one that when you look across the city, the fire department um, will raise every time. But I think there's um, opportunities to, that the, um, to work with the fire department. But also it's PBOT is the other um, person here that will um, limit or drive the development too. Let's go ahead and move to Maplewood. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Joan Fredrickson. I'm the West District Liaison. You've, you've met us practically all. <laughs> um, so now we're going to be talking about a um, area-specific discussion topic on the west side of town. Um, the question before you on this one is, uh, we have um, R1 comprehensive plan designation recommended for this area, and the question is, we're getting some testimony um, asking for the R7 zoning to be retained, and the question before you is, does the PSC support retaining the zoning here, the R7 zoning, uh, in response to testimony, or supporting uh, the current zoning proposal of R1? Uh, retaining the R7 zoning here with the comprehensive plan at R1 would require the property owner in the future to apply for a quasi-judicial review uh, map amendment and um, would require additional public process at that time. So here we have the map um, and hopefully, okay, <laughs> something that works, yay. Um, so this shows the recommended plan, comprehensive plan map, including the amendments. The site that we'll be talking about is this one here on the west. Um, I'll also be talking briefly about the other one, but we'll start with this one. Um, the text indicates the existing zoning, and the colors show the proposed uh, or the recommended comprehensive plan, as well as the... Just a vacation? Yes. <laughs> so you know, perfect. <laughs> Very good. This was a test. Okay, I'm done. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Do you like, have to come back to this neighborhood every six weeks? Is that put a rule somewhere? <laughs> so the street vacation that you talked about a couple of weeks ago is right here. It's southwest Florida for context. <laughs> so um, the R1 comp plan designation, just to recap, was recommended here. Uh, it was a property owner request and staff considered it and the PSC supported it um, and we supported it primarily because of its proximity to a variety of commercial services um, including the community center, the park um, and a transit along Vermont um, and also uh, the need for diversity of housing options. So just a little more context, um, the area under discussion is on Southwest 45th Avenue running north-south, just south of Southwest Vermont as well. Um, it's about half a block from this active, small but active commercial um, complex. And as I mentioned before, it's across from the community center and Gabriel Park. Uh, to the west, for further context, there are a couple of large uh, properties that are uh, churches, St. Luke's directly west, and St. John Fisher to the south. The R1 zoning, um, at least on this, the R1 comprehensive plan designation and zoning, at least on this western piece, on eastern piece here, um, also was uh, supported by the fact that a new local improvement district is being proposed that will bring sewer and sidewalks to this section of 45th Avenue here. So um, that's something else that, that was in the mix of our, our consideration. Testimony that we've been hearing, we've gotten about a half dozen pieces of testimony uh, so far are raising concerns about um, existing congestion, traffic congestions, and uh, scarcity of parking in the vicinity, primarily with people accessing the community center um, and the park. Um, they're also raising concerns about the potential scale of the future development. This is currently R7, and the area is fairly um, low-rise, 
with the exception of some uh, development on Vermont. Um, and so they're, they're raising those concerns. Also, the testimony is primarily referring to this site here along 45th, but um, I want to note that council is currently considering an amendment to this western side of it here, the St. Luke's uh, Church heard about this R1 compound designation and put in a testimony request and the, and the council picked that up. So there are really, we're specifically mostly talking about the piece that faces 45th, but there are ramifications also for the adjacent piece. Um, because if council decides to support an R1 comprehensive plan designation for this St. Luke's Western piece here, then staff will have to consider what to do with the zoning there as well. So whatever you tell us this evening will help in that deliberation as well. So, um, so I this think is, we I feel like maybe we could jump in and just, one. Yes. it seems like an exceptional location for R1 zoning <laughs> um, across the street from a park right next to a community center, um, the commercial node right there. So. Unless I, I'd be curious if other people think differently, but I'd be inclined to go with the original proposal. Yep. I just have one quick question. <laughs> quick, quick, quick. Um, value capture, is this an area for consideration of value capture? I mean, that's a question. That's one of the I mean, This is a pretty big step. R7 this is a big down step. To R, R1. Yep. Um, could we, I mean, I'm, I'm all for going to R1. But can we put it in the value capture question? Well, I mean, I think that's, we, we're not far enough along on that conversation to know whether um, we're going to have that tool in place to, to make it happen in the time. You know, but yes, absolutely, this would be a candidate. Um, the question is, is that greater than, you know, really having the development happen here, which is a, it's a really appropriate place um, for that to happen. So it's, it's tricky. So to put it another way, is this, was this already recommended for a, a zone? The company already had this as R1, is that right? So this is effectively a developer's request to get a free zone change if they're willing to be patient? Is that what's, which I have no qualms with actually, but um, is, is that what's going on at this site? Well, um, for the most part where we have, where it's appropriate to have, where we've recommended um, comprehensive plan up, up zoning or upgrading, um, we, are typically following it with the zoning unless there is something that really stands out as a reason, whether it's displacement or um, some other uh, infrastructure concerns that we have where we would want to keep the separation or the divide. So in this case, we are just following um, the designation that we propose because we think it's an appropriate place for it. Well, I guess I'm still inclined to support <laughs> and surprise the developers being this patient to wait till the comp plan's done to actually. Well, they may not, but. They might, they might just go get it some other way. Thanks. Likely will. So in general, um, nods? Yeah? Okay. Great. Thank you. You're right. Deborah, is there a wrap up or are we? I'm yeah, I, I had a question about the Elliott Conservation District, which wasn't on the list, Great. but I. Um... That, no, we moved the order. So yeah. this, oh, the, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You have one more? We do. And so, <laughs> and I know this is. Okay. Along. Okay, and this question actually has multiple parts, so I'm going to apologize in advance for. Can I summarize? <laughs> Somehow. <laughs> Marty, what do you think? Summary. We'll ask more questions if we need it. I promise. I, I'll, I'll try to be brief. <laughs> okay, so in doing the residential and open space zoning map, and as well as the mixed use zones map. There are issues where I am wanting to bring this to your attention. Otherwise, Barry is going to bring it to your attention when he comes to you in the mixed use zones project. But I'm going to beat Barry to it. So um, what we're talking about are areas that are currently zoned R5 or R2 that have an exist or they have a commercial mixed use comp plan. And this Comp plan is either new, so it's something that we have expanded within the 2035 comp plan, or it was applied back in 1980. 
So what we are wanting some direction from you all is um, what to do about these areas. And again, the choices are to consider rezoning these parcels to mixed use, consider rezoning these areas um, to the higher intensity residential zone, and when you see the map, you'll understand why, or retain the existing zoning. Most of these areas happen to be in my district. So the first is an example, again, of going back to Woodstock. So again, Woodstock Neighborhood Center, this is an area where um, through the Woodstock charrette process and you know, um, several years of conversations and testimony, um, we agreed to take um, kind of a, a jiggy-jaggy um, zoning pattern to the full block uh, mixed use on, uh, from Woodstock to Southeast Knight and then Woodstock to Southeast Martins. What that, um, one thing that we um, did to be kind of consistent across the board is that we are not proposing to upzone existing residential land to mixed use unless the three occurred. So whether or not there was a non-conforming commercial structure, and we had those conversations, whether there was a split zone, so meaning that a portion of the site was already commercial and a portion of the site was residential, or if there had been a, um, a very formal and vetted public process that um, uh, we were supporting that public process and um, uh, in are supporting a change from residential to uh, mixed use on the zoning map. So in this area, um, this just highlights the area where, you know, long term in the 25 year time frame, we are very supportive of there being full block mixed use um, de redevelopment in Woodstock. But currently, because those properties are residential, we're holding back. But you'll see that the zoning review area now has a proposal of R2.5. Then we have this, what Woodstock calls the no man's land of R5 zoning, but commercial mixed use comp plan. And then you go to the, the, the mixed use zoning along the boulevard. So again, this is an example in Woodstock. I have a few more examples. So that just gives you kind of a bigger picture of Woodstock and what's happening. And again, this is the current proposal on both the residential and open space zoning map and the mixed use zoning map. So this is currently what is on the map app. Okay, some other places are the area um, just north of Division, um, and then Chavez is just to the east there. Um, so this is really at kind of the key node of Chavez and Division. And again, this is an area where, so that's Chavez, right? So this is an area where back in 1980, there was the full block designation that um, city planners in the community um, you know, put at this key intersection. Because again, Chavez and Division are where there's two very um, heavily used frequent transit lines. Um, we um, are, Again, those are our homes along um, Crothers. And so we're not at this point proposing to go to the, the, the ultimate vision, which is mixed use. But again, it creates the situation of R2.5, R5, and essentially CM2 or what is a storefront commercial today. So it's almost like we've created these remnants by changing the zoning review area. We've trapped this residual R5 in the middle, and it, it's not proposed to change, but it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of in, in between. That's what the result of this. Area. OK. This is another area also in Richmond. Um, so again, this is uh, to the north along um, Chavez and just south of Hawthorne. Interestingly enough, in the area that is along Chavez, there's about four or five properties that have non-conforming density. And so those are R5 zoned properties that have duplexes or triplexes. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, so that's the situation here. This is a little different. So again, this is back in Woodstock in the, in the northwestern corner of Woodstock. So Holgate and again, Chavez. So Chavez is really the, the street that's bearing the brunt of this. Um, you have a situation where 
Um, the, the first circle is um, where the zoning is R2, and there's some duplexes that are located there. Again, the, the ultimate, um, you know, a 25 year lookout is that that would ultimately become mixed use. The area that's just to the east is actually zoned R2, but it's um, proposed, or it has a comp plan designation of R1. We're not proposing to change that at this time. Okay, last slide. Um, so this is again along Powell and Foster, um, also within uh, the Richmond, Richmond maybe Mount Tab uh, South Tabor. But um, so the, the first circle actually is um, an errata that I would like to correct. Um, that is a, a U-Haul. Um, it's actually a split zone site. So that's something that um, not only is a non-conforming commercial use, but it is a split zone. So that's something that I think that we will probably move forward and add to the mixed use zones project. But it's the one on the right or the east that again, um, you know, R5 zoning surrounded by mixed use to the south and to the west, but then again, adjacent to the R2.5 proposal. And I think that's. So is the direction well you're looking done. for is whether to include those in your review areas? Because that makes sense to me. I mean, it seems like a lot of these property owners might not um, be bothered, but you'd find out pretty soon. And mm -hmm. some of them would be saying, oh, I assume you could always build more here anyway. And, it, and so I guess it, it's, um, let me think I under, uh, share what I think I'm hearing from you, is to include them in the residential review areas. And so we would match the adjacent residential zoning that we are um, proposing a zone change, in most cases to R2.5, um, knowing that we, they will retain the mixed use comprehensive plan map designation and so they could become mixed use in the future. Um, so that- We understand, because you're pointing out that this is a residential open space code up that you're doing, and these are like ones that, that split that between the multi-dwelling. So is, the other, is there some other process the multi-dwelling is looking at this, or mixed use is looking at um, the same kind of issues you guys are, or bringing things so, up there? So Barry and I are having a little bit of tug of war right now. Okay, so yeah. because I, before you, First, I'm, I'm bringing up the issue. And, uh -huh. and so um, and my leaning is that, um, well, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily have a leaning, but if, if it was to fall into my project, then I would either keep the status quo or I would upzone to the adjacent higher residential zone. Mm -hmm. If it falls into Barry's project, then we would be going from a residential zone to a mixed use zone. So one approach might be to give Barry dib, dibs. If he thinks that they should go to multi to a mixed use, then he could say these should go to mixed use. And if they don't go in that way, then you could say, well, but you know, they should at least be two point five. Is that one strategy? Well, I think what we're um, you know just stepping back a bit, our criteria for changing residential um, properties to mixed use, we had a pretty narrow parameter, and it was again if they were non-conforming commercial if they had a split zone, or if they had gone through a um, planning process where there was a, a lot of public vetting. Um, otherwise, we were pretty conservative and we left the status quo. Um, and part of that is that um, we're not wanting to turn up the dial on speculation. So I guess the, the way I think about this is, in which context can I think about this more clearly? Right, and since a lot of these seem to be adjacent to mixed use, it would seem like I could more clearly think about this in the context of Barry's project. Um, so I'd be, in, you know, I think what Eli kind of said is, you know, let Barry propose them for mixed use if he thinks it makes sense, and then fall back to your thought process if they don't. That makes sense to me. Um, but yeah, you know, I'd give precedence to Barry's analysis process. I think. Go ahead. <laughs> So to be clear, status quo is keeping the designation. The zoning. 
Sorry, keeping the zoning residential, the designation mixed use. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're not proposing to change the, desig the, the comprehensive plan designation at this point. Um, all these areas that are pretty, at pretty key intersections and opportunity-rich areas, the question is what do we want to do in the near term and whether or not the city should initiate it. That's the question. The, the, um, the question of speculation if we keep the current, you, we kind of propose speculation to get to a commercial zone. And if we do R2, we kind of lead, we, we, they're still getting the up zone, but not to commercial, if I'm understanding that. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of a stepping stone. Stepping up. stone. Up. R5 is, you know, no speculation. Yeah. You go up to the next. Adjacent residential, it might be a little speculation, probably a little bit more so if you want to mix use. Mm -hmm. Mix use, yeah. And the okay. concern I have that is primarily an, an, an inner Portland concern and an inner pattern area concern is that um, I am having demolitions in replacement of one-for-one -one housing. And so you may have in houses that are... Um, in some cases modest, in some cases they've been renovated. But if there's a demolition with the R5 zone, they're going to be replaced with a very, very expensive house. So that, that is a, um, a market reality that is specific to inner Portland. I, Keeping I, the status quo at, R, at R5. I, I would tend to encourage, well, I wouldn't tend, I would encourage, um, Looking at it as what does it mean to have them go to mixed use zone? I think there's a tension there with uh, that you're you're going to have anyway. Um, and then the next step, and it, this goes again with Eli and Chris, is this is a fallback after we study that. If we find out that's just we we did turn up the dial too much um, through Barry's project, then we can fall back to the R two point five. Um, so mix the uh, the mixed use project will be coming here at your next meeting for a hearing. And so you're gonna, you can keep Perfect. this going. So you, I, think, I think it's a good one to just blend it together. So if you could encourage Barry to bring it up again, that'd be great. We'd love to talk about it more. <laughs> it, and then. I would encourage you also to think about if we're going from R5 to commercial, that's a big, value. That's a big lift. <laughs> so we're, this is value, truly value. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay. So wrap up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've already said this. We are, um, you'll hear about what we just heard about in mixed use, but the next step for residential and open space zoning is it's going to merge into this composite zoning map, which we will be publishing in June um, in advance of a July 12th public hearing. And I just want to note that if we are adding any new properties to that composite zoning map that haven't yet been notified through one of these other zoning map changes, they will get a new notice letting them know they have yet another opportunity or if their first, first opportunity to weigh in. Other people will have another opportunity to weigh in on things they've already looked at. So we'll be bringing new people into the mix potentially if we do add some of the properties that Marty was just talking about who haven't been notified of any zone change up to this point. Right. So we will be back with a composite zoning map in July. It's Going to bring it all yeah, together. All day work session on that. <laughs> it's yeah. It's, um, it's part of why we wanted to sort of vet some of these things with you today because you don't want to look at everything um, that's going to be that composite zoning map because that's going to be quite a bit. So hopefully it'll be organized. <laughs> Perhaps. Yes, Teresa. I just want to compliment your staff. That's amazing work, and it's just an incredible amount of detail, and just thank you for doing such a good job. Good job. Yep. Thank you. And thanks for uh, patiently waiting till 9 o'clock to go through such heady stuff. This is hard to do in the evening, so thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay. With that, we're adjourned. Thank you.